Story the microphone set up there. Okay. Ready, Mandy? Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the April 5th meeting of the San Luis Coastal Unified School District Board of Trustees. At this time, we'd like to ask those in attendance, please keep the, uh, Zoom particularly, please keep your uh, videos off and audio muted unless you're presenting information or speaking in public comment. We're offering translation services for our Spanish speaking attendees. To access translation, please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and then the language. At this time, we'd like to ask if anyone who needs translation would please click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta junta. Eh, vamos a tener interpretación simultánea al español en línea, pero necesitamos saber si necesitan de los servicios y para eso les vamos a pedir que levanten la mano en la sección inferior de la pantalla. Si es que sí necesitan los servicios, también va a aparecer el globo terráqueo. Por favor, uh, hagan clic en él y seleccionen español. Gracias. Okay. All right. Okay. The board met in closed session and we had several items in closed session. The first was anticipated litigation, one case. The second was student personnel stipulated expulsion hearing. We had another student personnel stipulated expulsion hearing. We had a personnel discussion reviewing and possible action on employment, dismissal or discipline of a district employee. We had a conference with our labor negotiators our agency represented designated representative, Dan Block, Director of, Le of Human Resources um, regarding our employee organizations, CSEA, SEIU, and SLCTA. The board, met in, the board also met in closed session to discuss and consider the approval of an agreement between the district and one of our families, which would extend a contract currently in place for non-public agency support through the end of 2022. This agreement is a mutual compromise that settles a disagreement on the appropriate placement for the student. The board voted unanimously to approve the agreement. The board is also reporting out on an action taken in closed session earlier this evening. By a vote of seven to zero, the board approved confidential resolution 18-21-22 regarding the non-re-election of a probationary cert certificated employee number 22-01-01. Uh, we need to go to 5.02 now, which is action on stipulated student discipline agreement number one. Do we have a motion to approve the stipulated dis uh, student discipline agreement? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Roger. Hold on here. And do we have a second for that? Mr. Buckman? Is there any further discussion on this item? Okay. Uh, Marilyn? Yes. Mark? Yes. Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Eve, sorry. Yes, you're right. Uh, Evelyn? Ellen? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries. 
six zero with one absence. Let's move on to item 5.03. This is action on stipulated student discipline agreement number two. Do we have a motion for this item? Well, I'll move approval of this item. Do we have a second? Second by Mrs. Sheffer. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I'm a yes. Ellen? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Evelyn, Eve, yes. Mark, yes. motion carries six zero with one absence. Let's move on to our consensus to, on the order of business. Do we have a consensus on the order Ms. of business? Mr. Unger? Yes. Could I, uh, before we move to that, yes. could I make a quick, can I interject quickly on the uh, item on the action consent? Yes. Make a revision to that before we move forward? Yes. Okay. Mr. Mayfield, are you back there? I am. Uh, we would like to change, uh, and I don't have the item number uh, in front of me, 11.05, the language on there from supporting for the dual language immersion uh, coordinator position from supporting the 9010 model to supporting the district stipulated uh, dual language immersion program. Okay. So that will be a recommendation that will be a recommendation and change of language for the uh, job description on 11.05. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayfield. That. Other than that, do we have a consensus on the order of business? Okay, uh, let's move on and get back up there. Let's see, 6.01, student representatives to the board. Uh, Nick, are you available? Good evening. Yes, I am. Hi, Nick. Hello. Go for it. All right. So a lot's been happening at Morro Bay. On March 25th, we had the neon dance and we had just over 500 kids and there were absolutely zero issues. So it was a raging success. Really fun. And then open house was last night. Um, I got to see Mr. Unger. That was really cool. We had performances from um, a sneak peek from the Susical, the musical. The choir performed. We had a couple student bands perform. It was really fun. Um, all the departments were there as well. So a bunch of uh, students and their parents had a lot of fun. And then Student Senate last week dove into a deep conversation about respectful speech and culture at Morro Bay. And they have plans to extend the discussion and they're gonna start proposing solutions um, after spring break. You're, Sorry, you're I hope you neck. can see me. I'm on my phone, someone called me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Alrighty, our boys volleyball team, they did really well. They actually won at the Fresno Christian High School tournament. And then ASB had a three-on-three -three basketball tournament last week. That was a lot of fun. The uh, winning team won Tacos Day Burritos, which is a favorite at Morro Bay. Um, this week, we have the SBAC standardized testing for all of the juniors and some of the seniors who haven't done their science testing yet. And then yesterday, some of the teachers and students welcomed the CEO, the COO, and the VP of Aircraft Main of ACI Jet, um, a local business partner took a tour of MBHS and they promoted a new training program starting in the fall at Cuesta. I guess there is a significant need for airplane mechanics and Cuesta is going to start a two-year certification program in the fall sponsored by said ACA Jet. Um, a student could attend, come out of the program making $65,000 uh, as a starting salary with jobs across the state and the nation. Uh, we wanted to thank Christine Robertson and the San Luis Postal Foundation for organizing this partnership. And last Thursday, we welcomed class of 2026. Um, they had a huge turnout and there was a lot of enthusiasm from the incoming eighth graders, soon to be freshmen. And we wanted to give a special thanks to the lead counselor, Elena Smith at Morro Bay and along with Shelly Benson, our counseling secretary, um, and Beth Saylor. 
the event was super fun and overall Morro Bay has been super busy, but yeah, we're counting the days now, so. All right. Well, thanks, Nick. And just a reminder, um, you're invited to stay in the meeting, um, but we realize that uh, and participate in the discussion, but we also realize that you may have uh, other things that you need to attend to. Uh, Noah, are you there? Noah from San Luis Obispo High School. Hi, um, Noah. Uh, by the way, before we start, Noah, congratulations on the big, vi the big, the big uh, baseball victory. You were prominently mentioned in the Tribune, and I read that. And I go, I know this guy. Um, unfortunately, Noah isn't uh, able to be here today. Uh, I just totally blew it. Oh my God! I you know, and I'm here in front of all these teachers, and I make a fool of myself. Someone else is new, right? Yeah, never mind. I remember. Steve Sorry, Gavin. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, so my name is Gavin McDermott. I am the treasurer at Slow High. Um, Noah wasn't able to be here today. Um, but yeah, so to get right into it, um, two Fridays ago, we had a Miracle Minute fundraiser um, in order to raise funds for the people of Ukraine. Um, the, the idea was to um, show, show what was going on in Ukraine uh, for the beginning of the week and on Friday during TNN, our um, student broadcasting network, have teachers pass around a plastic bag for students to donate money um, that goes directly to Ukraine through the International Red Cross Foundation. And in that one minute, we were able to raise a total of $8,577.50, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, it was really astonishing to see how generous our students and staff were. Um, and we got it all counted up. It was a lot of counting. Um, but the, yeah, the payment has been sent to the International Red Cross Foundation, which only has a 3% administrative cost. Um, moving on. So uh, recently in the past two weeks, theater has been putting on the Wizard of Oz. Um, and over the course of the entire week, there were multiple instances of sold out shows, which is pretty remarkable. I've heard, I didn't go personally, but I heard that it was very, very successful and very entertaining. Um, so that's there. Uh, spring sports have been coming along. Um, many, many teams have been winning in their respective categories. Um, and along with that, after uh, spring break, the week coming back, we will have our first in-person rally, or sorry, not in-person rally, indoor rally. And um, that's going to be very exciting. Uh, we also have um, Student of the Month Barbecue this Friday, which is uh, an awesome event that we get to do every month. Um, and this Thursday, we have Tiger Fest, which is a yearly opportunity for members of the public specifically eighth graders and, you know, new people to slow to come and tour our campus. We'll have um, various clubs out there. I know ASB has a table set up um, and we're selling merchandise. It's going to be a great time. Um, yeah, we had SBAC testing last week for the juniors. That went smoothly. Uh, and let's see what else. Um, yeah, we also have a dance next uh, sat or the Saturday coming back from spring break. It's Slow Cella. It is going to be a music festival that um, we have student performers and performers uh, or local performers coming, and it's going to be a blast. I think that about wraps it up. Well, thank yeah. you very much. Does Absolutely. anybody have any questions for Gavin? No, oh, by the way, um, I, I saw uh, the Wizard of Oz, as did um, Dr. Eisendrath Rogers, and it was really great. You, yeah. Oh, and, well, a bunch of us saw it, and I think we were all probably pretty darn impressed with it. So mm -hmm. they did a really nice job. Yeah. <laughs> Toto was cute. Toto was cute. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And like I said with before, you're welcome to stay and, and watch the meeting and comment uh, on items that you might find of interest, or we understand that you may have other things that you uh, may need to do tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate yep. it.
And then uh, is Lexi here? Lexi? Hi, Lexi. Hi. Hi, I'm um, from Pacific Beach High School. So I'm kind of just gonna jump in real quick. So um, last week we held an open house, which was really cool and really exciting for our students. Um, we welcomed families and we had a Cuesta um, table there and military recruits there and families just kind of got to walk around, explore campus, um, look at the classrooms. And it was all really fun um, just to be able to like socialize and have like your parents meet the teachers. It was really cool, really good experience. Um, so Student Senate is working on um, a job fair, which is really cool. It's also one of our SMART goals. So uh, the job fair that we're hosting is basically just calling local businesses from like around. Um, so Target, Costco, TJ Maxx, and Olive Garden are the um, businesses that I'm in charge of. Old Navy, Home Goods, Ralph's, and Whole Foods is one that's Will, that Will is a part of, who's a part of Student Senate. Sprouts, Panda Express, PetSmart, and Home Depot, um, Jules is part of, and CVS, Best Buy, Ulta, Buffalo Wild Wings, and Kohl's is something that Ms. Cooper is helping us with. Um, we're hoping to have this um, in between the month of May, so between May 2nd and May 20th. It's just going to be out on campus in the quad. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. It's going to give our students like um, experience, like kind of interviewing, doing mock interviews. They're going to be having um, resumes like ready to show. And I think it's going to be like a really cool experience. And then a lot of our seniors are working on scholarships. So that's really exciting. Um, we had one scholarship interview last week. We have two this week. And then they just kind of keep adding on as the months go by. So, yeah. That's great. Any questions for Lexi? No, well, thanks, Lexi. Um, ooh, we are getting some feedback here. Um, Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing more about what you guys are doing. You know, we know that scholarships are really important. And I think we're looking forward to your graduation, which should be in about two months. It's always one of the highlights for us. So thank you very much. Okay, let's go on to item number 6.02, which is Laguna Middle School highlights. Uh, Mr. Mayfield. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Unger. As you mentioned, Laguna Middle School is on for highlights tonight, and we have Principal John Calandro from Laguna to share uh, some highlights with us. Mr. Calandro. All right. Thank you, Rick. Good evening. I'm sorry I cannot be there uh, this evening because uh, we just finished up some interviews here, so I couldn't make it over to J2 in time. Uh, I apologize in advance to Maria Torres because I'm going to go uh, as quickly as possible. So let me make sure I have everything set up here to go. And give me a second there. Okay. Let me get to where I can click. Can everyone see my screen here? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, as uh, Rick said, I am John Clandro, principal of Laguna Middle School, and we're all about kids. Um, I absolutely love middle school. If you haven't been to middle school in years, uh, you're certainly missing out because middle school is a very, very busy place. Here's a group of kids that were just out on the playground. They said, hey, Mr. Clandro, take my picture. I said, why don't we take your picture? I don't know. Put it in the newsletter. So I did. Uh, so here they are kicking off our presentation for tonight. And that's one of the things that I absolutely adore about middle school kids is you just never know what you're going to get. A quick example is uh, I'm out at lunch one day and I see this young lady and she starts to unpack things from her lunch bag. And she's got a board there in front of her and all of these little containers and things start to come out of these little containers. And suddenly I look over and she's got uh, a group of friends gathered around her and I'm watching all of this happen and they're watching her and again this is just an average everyday lunch and when she's done she's got this amazing charcuterie board with this beautiful uh rose made out of salami and that right there is is middle school you just never have any idea about how wonderful uh our students are, what their hidden talents may be, but at middle school, we get to find a lot of that stuff out. So it is an absolute hoot to be here every single day. Um, I am fortunate enough to work with an amazing staff from our teachers to our custodians, to our librarians, to our office staff, to our counselors, our support staff. Everyone is absolutely amazing. And we're all here for the same reason, because we love students. Uh, so 
academically, what happens at Laguna Middle School? Uh, we keep our kids as active as humanly possible. Uh, our eighth graders uh, last week were doing our cow eye dissection. They were learning the eyes structures and their functions. So the cow eye dissection uh, is always fascinating for kids to, to do. They uh, jump in and get to find out the lens and pick apart all of the, the structures of the eye and they have an amazing uh, active time there. In PE, uh, our students are doing lacrosse right now. Our seventh grade students uh, are, are doing, just finished up a dance unit and hopefully the video will play for me so you can see what that looks like. <laughs> Each of the groups had to come up with their own choreographed routine, so you can see them all practicing their different routines. Uh, our PE department is absolutely incredible. It's moving and doing all kinds of great stuff. Move on to our next slide here. There we go. Uh, in math, our students are using the CPM math program where they are working together on solving problems. So uh, on this day, they were solving word problems uh, using equations with one variable. They had to figure out which variable they were going to be using. Um, and as the students worked to solve the problem, they then had to create a, a poster that showed how they had come up uh, with their solution so they could share that and share their thinking with the rest of the class. In history, we did something very similar. Uh, on the top sides there, we've got uh, Mr. Uh, Jones's Spanish history class uh, looking at the uh, various things in history. They had to create posters, again, do a little bit of research about their topic, and then present it to the other students in the class. So very similar to what they were doing in math. A lot of that um, students doing the research, working together, and then presenting their thinking to others. On the bottom there, we've got Mr. Townsend's class uh, who are sharing a pen pal uh, exchanges with a group of students in Scotland. Uh, most recently, they uh, swapped food, snack foods that they love. So they sent off um, a box of um, Takis and Taco Works chips uh, to their counterparts in Scotland and got back a bunch of uh, tasty Scottish treats uh, back. And then the students compared notes on uh, what they liked best. We found out that Takis are way too spicy for most of the Scottish students. <laughs> Hey, hey, John, I, I've got to I've got to ask if you can hear me. Uh, how did Taco Works chips uh, compare to haggis? Uh, <laughs> fortunately, we didn't they didn't send any haggis. We, we keep asking. But, you know, as, as uh, the students, I think, are a little gun shy on that one. Um, choir is, is one of the things that we're fortunate enough to uh, have at our school. And if you didn't catch our choir performance when they were at Slow High, uh, this is what they sounded like. Get it going here. And we love that we've got the performing arts and uh, Rick Fox has been great job. Not bad. There we go. And there we go. Uh, in our English, uh, Mrs. Furtado's class just finished a poetry unit. So we had uh, students create some absolutely uh, amazing free verse poems there. Um, not going to give everyone enough time to read that because I was told to keep it quick. So I'm going to keep on moving. But you can find this uh, in the board docs, hopefully. Uh, our uh, CTE courses that we have, we, of course, were the, the launching uh, point for all of our CTE programs at the high school. So uh, our Family and Consumer Sciences just did their T, where the students um, plan the arrangements, plan the menu, uh, and then invite guests and they practice their manners uh, and share the food that they've created. Our uh, industrial tech class um, had a group of metal minions create metal projects that they uh, went over and uh, did as a thank you for uh, some of the companies that donate metal to our shop. So this is some of their projects. They made a box that actually opened up and the cake lifted out of it. It was really cool. Uh, we just finished our March Madness intramurals. So we had uh, students in both seventh and eighth grade homeroom classes 
uh, go uh, head to head. Uh, we ended up with, of course, two champions, just like March Madness, one, one loss and you're done. Uh, our seventh grade champion was Mrs. Shimke's Gonzaga classes, and our eighth grade champion was Mrs. Madison's Texas classes. I don't know what it says that both of them are PE teachers. Maybe they were uh, practicing when they shouldn't have been. I don't know. Uh, but no, it was a lot of fun for kids. Uh, as far as other activities go on our campus, we've had we've got 10 clubs going on on campus. We've had three movie nights, two after school activities, three student recognition luncheons so far. Um, we've got pictures here from our garden club. Um, we've got students who are, are in a book club uh, on Fridays here in our library. So we try to keep our kids active when they're not in class as well. Some student art. We just had an art competition for our yearbook that was, uh, so this was posted up in the library for our time. Absolutely spectacular student art. Um, each month we pick a different theme uh, to be talking about and our students come on on morning announcements and actually present uh, information about that theme. So for Women's History Month, uh, once a week we had students come in and on morning announcements do announcements about women's history, giving uh, pertinent figures. Um, right now we're doing um, Arab American uh, Heritage Month, so we have students coming in and talking about Arab Americans. So uh, all of the students have volunteered to do that. So they come in, they do their research, and then they come and they present it to our school. This is just some photos from our after school activities of kids out having a good time. We had our student senate meeting. Uh, we've got a great group of student senators who are doing amazing things uh, for our school and really helping us guide where we go next. And our AVID uh, group just got back from UCSB. They did a tour of UCSB. Uh, so there's a photo on the top from them at UCSB. And on the bottom, uh, they had toured Cal Poly earlier in the year. So our AVID students are going uh, to do those college tours to inspire them to keep on moving uh, and get to college. Uh, athletics are plowing along. Uh, this is just some quick stats from our athletics. We have 80 students who did cross country, 24 who did girls volleyball, 26 who did boys and girls basketball each, 26 in boys ball volleyball. We have currently 123 students in soccer, um, 23 students doing wrestling. So right now we've got 172 students who are right now involved in the sport. And we've got uh, 46 projected for water polo and 41 for track and field. Uh, when you put all that together, we'll have about 352 total athletes at Laguna Middle School, which is 48.9 or 0.09% of all of our students. Um, 46 of those students are multi-sport athletes um, who've done two or more sports. And this is our last slide. Our students are absolutely amazing. So we love being here every day. We love uh, getting kids excited about their future. And we've got a great group of kids and teachers who help us do that every day. So that's it for me. Well, thank you, Mr. Calandro. Is there any, are any board members who have comments or questions? Mr. Buckman. Yeah. I have to thank you for um, sharing this with us in the, in the agenda ahead of time. And I was so excited. I, I share it with colleagues. Um, Pretty much around the state um but specifically with friends down in santa maria bonita so thank you very much thank you thank you anybody else okay thanks again john all right thanks so much all right item 7.01 is correspondence at the time the agenda was published no official correspondence was received we'll now move on to public comment and i want to read a statement about public comment before we start at this point in the agenda the board welcomes comments on matters of district interest. The board will listen, but cannot engage in discussion or take action on items not listed on the agenda. Generally, the section of the agenda is for individuals or a representative of a group to address the board on issues not listed on the agenda. Speakers who wish to discuss items on the agenda are requested to wait until that item comes before the board. However, comments may be given on agenda items at this time if it's not possible for a speaker to stay until the agenda items heard by the board. If you submit written comments on a topic, you will not be allowed to also speak on that topic. Comments or correspondence submitted anonymously will not be accepted. If you'd like to speak in person, please complete a yellow public comment request form and submit it to Mrs. Dawson. In-person public comment will be heard first. If you wish to speak via Zoom, click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and select raise your hand. When your name is called, you may restart your video if you wish and unmute your audio. If you need assistance with your video, please let us know and we'll attempt to fix it. If you have a problem with your audio, please click on the thumbs down icon and we'll attempt to assist you. 
Written public comments submitted prior to the board meeting will be read by Mrs. Sheffer following the verbal public comment. All public comments will be limited to three minutes, which is a limit of approximately 450 words in written comment. You may not cede any remaining time uh, to another speaker. Any portion of your comment extending past the 450 word limit may not be read aloud due to time restrictions. All written comments that are not read into the record will be made part of the meeting minutes, provided that such comments are received prior to the end of the meeting. Please be aware that written public comments, including your name, may become public information. So at this point, um, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Sheffer, who will uh, read the uh, public comments and call them up. Thank you. At this time, I just have three yellow sheets. So if there are additional people wishing to speak and fill them out, if you would get it to Mrs. Dawson, she'll get it to me or we'll take care of it. First, I have Adam Bash, followed by Robin Haas, followed by Emily Capilano. Hello, everybody. Probably loud enough without the mic, but make sure uh, Zoom picks that up. Don't want to waste any of my precious three minutes here. Uh, some of you have heard some of this before. Uh, I know I've met with Dr. Prater and um, Dr. Frost uh, before as well. Um, we've talked a lot over the last uh, meeting about uh, some of the negotiation stuff as far as people have talked about the cost of homes and things in the area and the negotiations as far as the uh, salary raise and all that. I'm going to talk about it from a slightly different angle and from the idea of a what the workload is at as a special education teacher. So I guess I'm representing special education tonight. Um, and I've had this similar meeting with um, Dr. Valentine, I think it was before and other groups over the years and uh, groups always been receptive. It's always been a productive conversation. So I know we can continue in that vein. Um, if you've never worked as an IEP manager or as a special education teacher, I'm just gonna paint a two minute and nine second picture of what that's like. Um, Right now, uh, I have a caseload of about 26 students. I do teach a full class load throughout the day. So I, I teach three classes. I have one class for a, a prep period and one class of uh, athletics. Um, those students over the course of the year are legally required to have an IEP meeting. Okay, they're legally required to have progress reports. They're legally required to have a triennial report written. Just doing some simple math. I don't have my Katie Porter whiteboard here. I don't know if anyone has a small portable whiteboard, but I have 180 prep periods throughout the school year, right? They're 180 work days. So those 26 kids automatically before the school year starts, that's 26 one hour meetings. Those IEPs legally required. That's 26 periods to write an IEP. That's 26 periods to process and do paperwork on that afterwards. Then you start getting into other stuff like training evaluations, secondary meetings, complicated cases with multiple meetings. I've worked this out and I've submitted this uh, before to uh, the smaller group, the CRT group. So this is uh, on record. It works out to basically my entire prep period is soaked up with this shadow job of being an IEP manager that I've been assigned in addition to being a teacher before I set foot in the classroom on day one of the school year. All right. Basically, my entire free time or prep time for the year is already assigned for the year before I walk in there. So when do I plan lessons? Or if I'm planning lessons during that time, when do I do the IEP stuff? And so what happens is we squeeze, right? We all know how this works. We're all professionals, all right? You do stuff in the evening. Uh, you work through your lunch break. Uh, kids are working on something. You're working on something else. So what happens there? Quality education goes down a little bit because people are squeezed and people are stressed. So um, I just wanted to paint that picture a little bit, uh, put a little bit of numbers game to it. We did get the eight days in the last negotiation cycle. We really appreciate that. The teachers have been using those. So those are those eight release days. And that basically allows us just to bail out a little bit out of the boat, uh, help us uh, stay afloat to the next uh, island where we can recharge. So um, as you're going through negotiations, please consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bash. Um, good evening, board members and colleagues. Um, my name is Robin Haas, and I have had, had the honor and privilege to work in the San Luis Coastal School District for over 16 years as a reading recovery and classroom teacher. Um, my children have had the good fortune to be students of many of your classrooms. Um, as we all know, these past two years have been 
especially challenging for both students and educators. Initially, it was the panic that ensued when I realized I had to join the 21st century by improving my technology skills. Following an emergency meeting at Monarch Grove where we were basically told to learn how to use Google Classroom and Zoom overnight, I went home and cried. I didn't think I could do it. I called a colleague in tears saying I might need to find a new job. But once I was done emoting, I did what I knew I needed to do. I taught myself how to design engaging slideshows, use Google Classroom and Zoom. Ultimately, I knew I didn't have a choice because I couldn't let my students down. Several months into the next year of distance learning, I was asked if I would be willing to teach a distance learning three, four combo, which I had never done. And I said yes, because it was the right thing to do and I knew I could do it. Two nights before the first day of school this year, I was asked if I was willing to teach a two, three combo. And I said yes again, because I knew it was the right thing to do and I knew I could do it. Then on the afternoon before school started, I tripped on the uneven sidewalk outside of my classroom and did a face plant. My principal kindly wiped the blood off my forehead and I insisted I was fine and got back to work. There was no way I was gonna miss the first day of school. I tell you these stories, not because I am so unique, but because I am a mirror of the 400 plus educators in this room and at home right now who have said yes countless times, countless times because it's the right thing to do. Whether it's dealing with a suicidal teenager, giving COVID tests, being a shoulder for students and parents to cry on, and now helping children learn how to be in school again. We say yes and then some. I am not the only educator in this room who has shed blood, sweat, and tears in the name of our children. Someday society will truly value education and pay educators what they are worth. In the meantime, you have the choice to do the right thing. You have the choice to pay us a living wage. If you choose not to, you will not be able to attract new educators or retain the ones you currently have. Educators deserve a chance to save for a home in a town where they are employed. We should also be able to put a little something away for our children to go to college and build a nest egg for our retirement. While fancy buildings, new pools, and football fields look great, the most valuable asset in every school is the people who work there. Without teachers, counselors, and nurses, to name a few, all you have is empty buildings and fields. We are your most valuable asset. Please consider this fact and act Thank appropriately, you. appropriately when you choose how to compensate Thank us for our thanks, blood, Robin. sweat, and tears. Show us you value our Robin, dedication I, and I well can't let you go well past three minutes. Robin, hey, Robin. Um, Robin, if you would, if you have those written notes, if you would like to give them to Mrs. Dawson, she'll see that the board gets them. And I would just remind everybody, we cannot allow you to go past three minutes uh, during public comment. Mrs. Sheffer. Uh, Emily Capilano, please. And then if anyone else has a sheet uh, to give to Mr. Pinkerton or Ms. Dawson, and I'll get it. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Emily Caplano. I was here last time. I'm the president of the San Luis Coastal Teachers Association for the fourth year. And I'm also a teacher, used to teach special education for 24 years. And I'm in um, a third grade class now at Baywood. Um, I'm speaking um, on a, the message similar to what I said before, but what I wanna let you know is all teachers, all educators are committed to a high quality education and everything that it entails. In order to provide this level of education to our students, we are asking our district for specific improvements. Staffing. We need more certificated staff to support students in all levels of education, including more counselors, more nurses, more psychologists, more speech and language pathologists, more special education teachers, and specialists, and more teachers. Adding more certificated staff to uh, to work in our schools and in our classrooms will directly benefit our students and our community. Then we need a livable wage. And we need a little livable wage because we need to recruit and retain certificated staff. It's becoming an issue within SLCUSD. Uh, I, I was in HR the other day and I saw the board 
and there is like, I don't know, 20 special ed positions available. <laughs> and some of them have not been filled all year. And you guys know that, but it's pretty serious. Um, our starting salary does not support living on the Central Coast any longer. With the staggering cost of home prices increasing over 11% and rent increasing over 6% from last year, staff are unable to afford to live here or to move here. I don't know if you notice, but there's really not a lot of new teachers here and new educators. And that's because they are tenured, they're not tenured yet, they don't have permanent status. And they're a little nervous about coming forward because they're new, but they, they, we went to every single site and they are worried about being able to stay here. I know several just at my school alone that are moving. They're leaving. Some are leaving education at my site. I have someone leaving education. I have a couple moving and a couple asking for transfers and not because it's not a great school, but because they can't afford it. They can't afford to be in education anymore. They found a place uh, maybe up in Sacramento that's more affordable. So that's the reality of it. And we're not really living it yet, except for in special education, but it's going to be worse. It's going to be harder for us to get and retain teachers. So we really need to look at this very wide-eyed. And um, I really thank you for your time and um, for listening, and considering. And if you want to talk to me, you can let me know and I'll come and talk with you anytime. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Is Myla Bukovic Labar? Very good. Sorry. Good evening, President Unger, school board members, Dr. Prater, and members of the district office. My name is Myla Vujovic Labar. This is my 38th year teaching in the San Luis Coastal Unified School District. Every single day that I wake up, I feel blessed, not only for my family, friends, and health, but for my, I'm, for my job. I am doing what I love. I teach. With the escalating cost of living in San Luis Obispo, I am grateful to be a homeowner. However, having dealt with escalating property taxes and utility bills, I'm not retiring anytime soon. At our last board meeting, I listened to impassioned speak speeches of younger teachers. Some of those young teachers commute over 30 miles and have childcare, raising rents and ra raising fo rising food prices to be concerned about. The San Luis Coastal School District has always hired the best and the brightest. I want the San Luis Coastal Unified School District to continue to employ the best and the brightest. Without a significant salary increase, I fear these individuals will seek employment elsewhere. The group before you tonight endured the pandemic, teaching without complaining, and always putting the needs of the students and their families first. Now we are all forging ahead with a variety of new teaching skills, thanks to our fabulous IT department and enthusiastic students. The road ahead needs to be filled with stepping stones to success. One of those stepping stones is, without a doubt, a significant salary increase. This will decrease the stress and anxiety that many of our teachers are currently experiencing. If you have any doubts about the excellence of the teachers in our district and whether or not their skills should be compensated, please do start visiting our campuses more often. Your presence will be embraced and you will put your head down on your pillow that night filled with bliss and assured that the teaching staff of the San Luis Coastal Unified School District does deserve a significant raise in addition to praise. Thank you. Thank you. The last sheet I have right now is Emma Manis. Hi, my name is Emma Manis. I'm a third grade teacher at CL Smith, and I feel very passionately about all of the educators in this room. It's honestly heartwarming to see so many people who care so much about the children in our community. I am a teacher that has spoken previously, but my educational background didn't lead me to teaching initially. I went into college not knowing what I wanted to become. And the funny thing is everyone knew I would become a teacher. <laughs> I'm actually a fourth generation teacher with teachers in my family who have graduated and continued to teach at Stanford University. 
I have three bachelor's degrees, psychology, sociology, and political science. I graduated with those three degrees in four years and then attended Cal Poly as a student teacher. I was really lucky to student teach in this school district. Honestly, it helped me become the best educator I could be on my very first day of school. Teachers in this room may know me as Emma Colco previously. <laughs> and I just love teaching. And I was so honored when I reached job security as someone who's under the age of 30. I have my own health insurance, which means so much to me. But my career does not mean as much to me as my mental well being. My career can't mean as much to me as I make the same amount that my husband, who is a bartender at Olive Garden, makes yearly. We are not giving teachers enough credit for what they do. Hearing that ACI Jet is offering students from our district to go to Cuesta for two years to earn 60 or $65,000, I don't remember which number it was, but I remember that it's more than I currently make. We need to value our teachers. You are going to lose incredible teachers if you do not. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have anyone else who submitted a yellow form. Um, Mrs. Dawson, is there anybody who wishes to address us on Zoom? I don't believe we have any written uh, public comment at this time. Seeing no one, um, we'll close public comment. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. We'll move on to item number 8.01, business and budget updates. Mr. Pinkerton. So just a couple of things, couple of things tonight to report to the board. We um, we have our new green lawn mower, our new electric lawn mower that we uh, we are trying out. You know, trying some different types of uh, as as we've talked about before with kind of the climate committee trying some new. Um, electric blower, leaf blowers, lawn mowers. Uh, we're getting a bus. We're looking at uh, potentially getting a truck for one of our fleet rides. So it's um, it's definitely an important task for us to try these things out. So initially, this lawn mower um, that we've used it works well. It's great. Kind of the guys getting getting adapted to it. Um, the, the charge doesn't hold great, but but they're able to. Um, they are able to get some more batteries. They recharged it the second time, you know, fully. They didn't know. So they're kind of working out kind of the, the Nick's, you know, kind of the little odysseys. But one of the positive things about it um, in particular is that it's not loud. So in terms of like being able to, to mow in between classrooms, sites, those types of things during the school day um, is something that we look forward to as a, as a possibility. So again, those leaf blowers, those types of things are too loud for classrooms. Um, during the day. So it, it should provide some flexibility to uh, the grounds crew, which um, will help them in terms of achieving their job and getting their job done. Uh, TKK, Pacheco, Teach, Open Enrollment have concluded um, along with Baywood. Um, and so during the month of March, you know, it's open to, to parents to um, one, initially for this first time kind of signing up for TK, right? We're offering TK, um, trying to offer it at every single one of our elementary sites except for Teach. Um, because they're fourth, fifth, and sixth, of course. Um, so, so those numbers are in. They're low. I will tell you, kind of initially, I'll I'll, I'll share kind of the overall um, kindergarten TK numbers. But it does seem like we're we're low overall in, in both TK and kindergarten to to start the year. So um, I'll be working with Mr. Mayfield in terms of kind of planning where where staff goes, where kids go, those types of things. The um, the open enrollment uh, lotteries will happen. I believe it's the I think the 17th, 18th, 19th. And so we'll be letting parents know um, at those times in terms of who got in and kind of that priority list as we move through. So we'll be working with all of that. Um, and then of course that has a direct line with staffing 
um, at our school site. So we kind of, you know, after kindergarten enrollment, we get the numbers, right? We look at staffing, we look at class sizes. Um, in the past, we've always tried to limit uh, combo classes as much as possible, as the board will know. Um, and so I'll be doing that exercise with principals, going through everything um, and trying to figure out, you know, kind of where we're at overall um, with, with our staffing, in particular at our, our elementary sites. At the secondary sites, there's really a handful of kids that want to go from Loams to Lambs, Lambs to Loams, so slow high to Morro Bay, Morro Bay to, to slow high. So, um, we, you know, we pretty much just allow that to happen. The principals, you know, we'll talk to each family, uh, make sure they understand the attendance policies and getting to school and those other types of things um, be, before they let them come over. Um, and then, your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Pinkerton. When you looked at, um, you know, this, the uh, enrollment for TK and Kinder, mm -hmm. is it early to, I mean, typically it's kind of, you know, beginning of the year, are these numbers kind of similar to numbers like at the beginning of the year or in the, this time of year, we typically don't get necessarily a lot and we get that later in flux. So, so we talked to the principal meeting today about that. And I just, I think they're low. So compared to like after kindergarten enrollment last year versus this year, they seem low. Now that said, we have to, you know, I'm going to be looking at the data a little bit more, right? Because with the TK students that are currently TK for us, did they're not registering per se, you know, as a new student, they're just going to be moving up. So I, I have to balance all of that. But just my, my first blush overall is that it's kind of a, a low number. Um, but but again, I'll share that with, with the board, um, with sites, right? I'll be working directly with principals. And then what I do is I set up a Google spreadsheet. So And then I ask the secretaries on a weekly basis to update it. So let me know. You know, kids come in, families come in. Um, we try to always leave room. You know, we realize families are going to move in the summer, come, you know, spring, those types of things. So um, we always definitely try to leave room in each of the sites so that we anticipate a little bit of growth as things go. But just big picture seems a little low, you know, kind of this first blush, but, but I'll, I'll report back. Um, and, and then lastly, uh, Mr. Bonin and myself were able to attend the citywide uh, safety training. Uh, last week, which was nice. So it was there, the city kind of got together with fire department, police, um, public works, all the agencies, and they did, um, they did kind of a, a mock situation. And uh, it was nice for, for Mr. Bonner and myself from a school district standpoint, because part of the situation uh, led to one of our school sites being impacted by um, the emergency. And so uh, it was nice for us to kind of sit with them, walk through it, you know, uh, it was good for them to see that as a school district, we have our own safety plans. We will evacuate schools. We will move. We don't wait for the city to tell us what to do in terms of protecting our kids and our staff. Um, and so that was nice to just, again, sit with them. And like they thought they were going to direct us where to go, what to do. And we, I was like, listen, we've already evacuated. We, our bus is already there. We've already moved the kids off the campus. So um, if anything, we could become a resource for them in terms of having our buses available after our kids are safe, after they've uh, been moved off campus. But uh, Resolute actually was hired by the city who we of course work with for our safety planning. And so um, I, I look forward to doing kind of a tabletop exercise with all of our sites and, and with our, you know, start maybe with our principals and our district staff um, as well as the board and then kind of work with, with teachers and you know more on a, a school level in terms of what would happen. Because um, in this case, there was the possibility that the principal wasn't there, that something might have happened, uh, the office, the secretary. So, you know, do teachers have what they need to know what to do in those situations? Um, so, it was, again, it was just good to kind of think through all the different steps that would happen in an emergency and, and really the communication that needs to happen across the board um, as we move forward. So I look forward to using Resolute and helping us uh, do that in the future. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Mr. Pinkerton? Okay, let's move on to uh, educational services update, Mrs. Frost. Yes, thank you. Just a, just a couple of short updates from educational services. I do want to thank our LCAP advisory committee. They met last week. Uh, we've been talking about the LCAP for several board meetings, and you're going to hear a lot about it tonight. But this is a representative group that takes all of our LCAP feedback 
goes through it together and gives us broad themes. It's a tremendous amount of work and they did a fantastic job and I'll show you some of their work this evening. We also had Student Senate last week and I've talked about Student Senate before, Golden Bell winning group. Every secondary school represented amazing students. We learned, um, Dr. Prater had them um, talk about how long they'd been on Student Senate as part of their um, introduction. Some of our kids have been on Student Senate for six years. Just that commitment commitment to student senate, commitment to improvement on their campuses, just amazing. But they were setting goals for their own sites, but they also heard about the LCAP. We went through a presentation with them like we do with all of our sites, and then they were able to give us feedback in all of our focus areas so that we could take that into account when we're building our LCAP, a really, really powerful opportunity. And then just one more time reminding the board that it is hiring season. So our directors, our principals are out there trying to find the best and the brightest to work for San Luis Coastal. Um, definitely looking for special education. You're hearing that and also looking for um, bilingual teachers to work with our students. Okay, questions for Mrs. Frost. Okay, um, 8.03 measure D update. Back to you, Mr. Pinkerton. Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, as you probably walked into the building, you saw the, the beautiful slow high track and field being put together right and um, completing. I, I think they're going to be putting the actual uh, artificial, you know, kind of turf on the on the lanes very soon, right? So that'll pop a little bit even more as we go through. Um, you know, little things that we we ensure, right? The we, we like to make sure that Morro Bay has everything that slow high has. So I will tell you that. Um, the new scoreboard is so fancy at Slow High that we have, we will be buying one for Morro Bay High as well, you know, in, in terms of that. So working with um, sites. So again, as we go through this kind of measure D, we've always tried to make sure that both sites have similar, you know, not equal always, right? But, but at least have the same, um, you know, similar uh, accessories and things like that. So that, that's something that's key at, at Morro Bay High in particular. So we'll be you know, Mr. Scully and the staff will be happy to know that that's, that's coming on their behalf. Um, it's a really cool school board is what I will tell you, right? Like they can take an iPad and walk around and you can like, you know, be down on the field and it shows up on the Megatron. Like it's, it's really cool. Um, so those are things that of course, both school sites will need to have, of course. Um, so looking forward to that. Uh, I, 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 we met with staff at, at the LCAT meeting at Morro Bay High School. Um, recently, and you know, they had concerns about Morro Bay and you know construction and timing, and you know it's um, it's a difficult path, right, to uh, to have school going right while you're doing construction. Um, and so we're close; we're, we're near the end of our projects, right? Uh, we've had to do some redesign, some budget issues along the way at both sites um, that that we're kind of getting through. So tonight was very happy. We'll be bringing the GMP for the north section of the 100 building. Um, which came in a little bit lower than we had anticipated, which is fantastic news because um, we were really worried about inflation and the possibility of what could happen um, with that. Uh, so, so I'll be bringing that up a little bit later, but um, you know, there, in part of that meeting, one of the things they said was, hey, you got the hotel out front. How come they're able to build the hotel so fast compared to you know, the B building or whatever? So just so the board knows, I have Chris Bonin is going to be setting up a time with Rick Stimson to meet with the staff at Morro Bay High School. Um, they're going to walk the current project, so that would be the theater, multi-purpose room, cafeteria, because I think it's really critical for staff to see the inside of that building and what goes into it, um, and, and now's a great time as things are going, um, and then he's also gotten the uh, construction schedule for the motel out front, so it'll be nice to compare that, you know, kind of what they're seeing, what they anticipate versus the reality of, of both documents, so um, again, you know, we, we're open, we're always dialoguing, having a conversation with staff, we want them to understand, right? How this goes, what happens. Um, so I think it'll it'll be good for the staff to understand, and hopefully will help them in terms of knowing you know that we are progressing at a good pace and getting there, and um, you know getting things done. So Chris is going to kind of open that up to the staff to ask them if they would like to come. Um, and so what you'll find is that the the motel when you build something right, that initial pop of they're putting up the framing, everything it looks big, it's all great, it's wow they're moving so fast, and then it's all the other stuff happens really really slow long term. So um, they're actually, if anything, we might even be on a faster pace than, than the, the motel in terms of the construction schedule for those buildings. And so, you know, we, we know them, we've tied into the, the group. So Chris has all that data and he's going to share it with staff and, and set up a time to meet with them very soon. Okay. Uh, 
Mrs. Roger. Mr. Pinkerton, isn't it also true that school construction is held to different standards than typical commercial construction? It is. So that we have to yeah. get um, different approvals yeah. uh, than they do and our requirements, our building requirements are different and sometimes more complex? Definitely from a more complex standpoint in terms of planning and architecture and all those types of things, right? Um, compared to maybe a, a motel hotel that, that's being built. But, um, you know, it was it's interesting just to look at that construction schedule for that building and then looking at ours, right? Because I wanted to see, hey, you know, like, are we really slow? Like, what's, you know, I, what's the truth behind it, right? Because there's, there's nothing to hide. It is what it is. So, you know, we want to we want to share that information. So hopefully it'll, again, just a positive thing to meet with staff, help them understand, walk through it. Um, so. I think your point's well taken though. When you get, when you're building new and you get the building enclosed, it takes on the shape of the building yeah. and it, and, there, and there's a big rush. You get yeah, a big the initial rush part goes happens. up really fast, right? So really like, wow, man, they're moving. They're going. So that's that's part yeah. of it. But it's a it's still it's a long process. It's taken a long time to go through. Modernization is tricky and tough, right? So it has. It um I'm sure it feels really long for the people on absolutely. those Absolutely. You live yeah, it every so, day, right? You've had to but, work, you know, work in class, work in hallways and just you know, sharing classrooms, all those types of things. So but it's, I hear uh, from positive. students and parents and teachers that they are really appreciative and enjoying um the completed yeah i mean the parts quad, of measure the, d yeah, that the, absolutely you know, that they're occupying now and yes long term using. two more years that campus is complete both both campuses will be you know fantastic places for kids right so in the end and thank staff. you yeah thank you Anybody else okay thank you and i believe you're next on item 9.01 resolution 19-21-22 authorizing filing of pre-K, TK, and full-day kindergarten facility grant applications. So yeah, we have a couple of resolutions tonight. This first one is a TK, uh, TKK. And so um, what we've heard is that um, the, the state is going to be putting money forward for uh, possible facility grants for both TK and K. We, we know as a school district in particular that we have a lot of needs in that area. So in terms of especially with the, the expanding, uh, potential expanding TK program into at least two to even three um, potential classes, right? TK classes, kindergarten classes need to be bigger. They need to have more room. We need, um, re, you know, modernized playground structures. We need grass, we need shade. We need all of these types of things to have a really positive program for kids. Um, and so what we're asking the board to do tonight is to pass this resolution um, that we're in front of you, which will basically give us the authority to file applications on the behalf of the school district so that we can go after funds for TK and K uh, modernization improvements. And what you'll see is we've listed all the school sites um, on this resolution because we want to be able to go for whatever dollars uh, we can uh, as we move forward. And we've been very successful with Measure D in getting these state funds. Um, we are working with King Consulting, who did a fantastic job on the demographic report that was presented to the board. Same group is helping us go after these uh, these potential funding mechanisms, and um, and so yeah, we're we're excited about the possibility of you know enhancing our campuses uh, potentially with these funds. Great. Um, any questions from the board? I'll go to the public then. Is there anyone from the public who is at the meeting who would like to address us on this item? And seeing none, Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone from on Zoom who would like to address us? No, okay. Um, I'll bring it back to the board. Would someone like to make a motion, Mr. Buckman? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 192122. Um, I, I, my sense is, and, I, and I don't, I'm the rest of the board, but TK and K full time and having the room for these students is critical. Um, especially in these days, and especially with the number of SED students that we have. So okay. I'm proud to make this motion. Someone would like to second that? Second by Eve. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for a vote. Mr. Buckman. Yes. Ms. Dobler-Drew. Mrs. Frame. Mrs. Roger. Yes. Mrs. Sheffer. Yes. And I'm a yes, motion carries 6-0 with one absence, uh, resolution number 21, I'm sorry, 2021-22, 20, 
resolution of intent to dedicate public pedestrian access, parking, drainage, and utilities access in handicapped parking stall and calling the public hearing in connection therewith. Uh, Mr. Pinkerton, cool. I believe it's back to you. Mandy, there's, there's another one I'll, I'll send you really quick that has a, a, a later, a more, uh, a different version really quick. So I'll do that. Um, one more thing for the TKK, just for the board to know, um, we will be looking at every single site and making a, a, an architectural plan, just so you know, for every single site in terms of modernization, what it'll look like. I'll be sharing that information with the board and um, we'll potentially be looking for an architect to help us with those plans. Um, we have Marshall Chesky here. To, to help us um, it, go through this next board uh, item. So here to answer questions for the board, but um, with our Avila Beach project, uh, we, again, we've developed that project along with, um, along with a, a, a group. What do you, what do you call it now, Marshall? What's the, what's the acronym? Shearage development. Shear development still, is it still? Yep, yeah, Shearage, <laughs> still Shearage development. Um, and so tonight there's basically some easements, some access that, that uh, need to move forward so that we can sell the current, um, the current, not sell, but lease the property, sell the units um, on that property. So Marshall can share that information with you. This is a two-step process tonight, right? So what we're asking uh, Marshall to do is to kind of talk about all the different potential easements, um, access uh, that, that we need to have for this project, right? And then what will happen is, Tonight, again, this is just the intent to move forward. And then that has to be a public document that's posted for 10 days. Um, and the actual easements, the actual approval for the board will come back to you at the May meeting. So instead of doing this one-off, one for the sidewalk, one for the access, one for the utility, one for the those types of things, we just, we, we lump the four projects together. Um, and I'm gonna send Mandy an updated map so that the board can see that on the screen. So Mr. Pinkerton, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Yes. So are we having a public hearing tonight and we're not voting on the actual resolution itself? So, so tonight we are voting on the resolution. Okay. And then in the future, we will have actual a public hearing as well as another resolution to pass the actual documents for each of the easements. So tonight is just passing a resolution for the intent I see. To do the following. That's it. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Hold on just a moment, please. If, uh, hi, Marshall Hilsky. Um, I think I've met most of you before. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm serving as the project representative. Um, I've been involved in this project for a while, not since the very beginning. Um, but what I wanted to do is there's a, an exhibit that I just need to go through to show you all the easements we're talking about here. I mean, none of them have a negative impact on the property except for one, the very first one, or doesn't have a negative. Um, most of them aren't permanent. The only one that's permanent is the public works one for the sidewalk. All the rest go away when the lease goes away. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so um, looking at that, the, the one that the Public Works is requiring for any development on the property is the red or purplish pinkish striped one there on the street side at the very, very bottom. The one that runs parallel to San Antonio Street. Did everybody see that one? Yes. Um, so that's the one that Public Works requires, and we have to get that easement before we can sell the, the last three units out there because um, Public Works requires the street frontage to be improved. So that's the first one. Um, the other ones are relatively straightforward and simple. They're straight, they have to do with access to the individual units from the various property, or pardon me, from the frontage and for utilities from the frontage. And then the one that's the other one is just that green one there that is required to have access to the schoolhouse. Um, we need to have that easement so we can have access to the schoolhouse from the upper side. So I think, I don't know if there's anything else I need to say, but so we're just looking to move forward with this. So in May, we can get these approved and then we can, sell the units up there on the top side because we can't do that until we get these in place. Okay. 
Mr. Buckman. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Marshall. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess I've been on, involved, I think, since the beginning on this, and, but it's been a while. It's been a long project. All right. And so my memory may not be as great, but is, is this something new that's come up, getting these easements, or did we no. know ahead of time? We've done the same thing for the buildings that, if you look at that map on the left side, it's the same thing we did there. I, I, it's I, just they have to come when they have to come. It's it's just the, it, within the progress. Right. And the board and the district knew that this was coming. Yeah. Okay, and then if I can ask a second question. Yes, please, go ahead. What does it mean, get an easement? Do we do we own the property? We're just, you still we're have just the... It? you have the underlying rights to own the property okay. you're just allowing these people to use the property okay. and like i said the public works one will be permanent the other ones just go timed with the lease so there's clauses in the, the easements that say they terminate upon termination of the ground lease so if we ever wanted to shut the door no i'm kidding <laughs> okay. i didn't hear that <laughs> did anyone else have questions for mr ohilski Thank okay. you for pronouncing Let's, my name correctly. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, is, there any, is, there any, is there any is there anyone from the public who is attending the meeting who would like to address us on this item? Okay. Seeing no one, Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone uh, in Zoom land that would like to address us? Mrs. Roger? Oh, I was just gonna make a motion if there okay. was no let me see if there's anybody from sure. no, we see seeing have we have no one. Mrs. Sure. Roger, are you oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Go ahead, Mrs. Frame. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question on the uh, the easement. You know, if we we grant the easement, but we you know own it, what does that liability look like? Yeah. There's um, liability insurance and a hold harmless oh, required from the easement holders. Okay. Except for the county one. Okay. That's a whole different game because the county has different liability standards than private parties. Okay. So just to follow up on that, so we are the easement holders, correct? No. No. Okay. You're Thanks. The, yeah, no. Thank you. Okay. Well, I take that back. You will be the easement holder for the the sidewalk. Right, right, right. Right. But the other ones are, yeah. Okay. So, Mrs. Roger, were you going to make a motion? I was. It's nice to see you, Mr. Wilson. Oh, whoops. Well, I'm yelling so you can hear me. Um, I will move uh, approval of resolution 2021-22, resolution of intent to dedicate public pedestrian access, parking, drainage, and utilities access, and handicap parking stall and calling public utility hearing in connection therewith, and although it doesn't say so, with regard to the... Um, Sure Edge Avila Beach project. Okay, do we have a second? Second by Eve. Is there any further discussion from the board? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Wait, just can I? Yes, I'm just for a technical answer. purposes. It's Elon LLC and Sure Edge Development. There's two ownership entities here. E Did you say Elon? Yeah, E L A N. Oh, okay. Not okay. E-L-O-N. No, not Elon. <laughs> but I just, if you could just make it for both of those. And because when Ms. we get the actual easements to them, you'll see which who holds what. Mrs. Dawson, have you got that correction? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We've got that corrected. I was, I'm glad that uh, I, I saw that Elon Musk bought what, 9% of, <laughs> of Twitter. And I was wondering if, if he was involved in this somehow, but I guess not. Yeah, so, Spending his money on Twitter. So. <laughs> so he doesn't have any left over for you guys. Um, <laughs> so we have a motion by uh, Mrs. Roger and a second by Ms. Dobler Drew. Marilyn? Yes. Eve? Yes. Kath, uh, Evelyn? Ellen? Yes. Mark? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries 6 0 with one absence. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month. Um, let's see, we've been at it since four o'clock and it's 6.30 right now. Does the board wish to take a break before we start our next? The board wishes to take a break. Uh, we'll take a break for, let's say 11 minutes. We'll resume at uh, 6.45 with item number 10.01,
which is board priority number one, local accountability control plan, LCAP overview. Thank you. We'll be, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll recess until 6.45.
So item 10.01, board priority number one, local control accountability plan, LCAP overview. And this will be presented by Mrs. Frost, I believe. Yes, Mrs. Frost. Yes, thank you. And Mr. Mayfield will be helping me as well. Thank you. So we're here this evening to um, talk about the LCAP overview. This is really the first of three board meetings where we are going to be talking about feedback we have received from our stakeholders and the actual LCAP plan that we are putting together. That means action items, expenditures, etc. So kind of anticipating those next two meetings as well. I also want to remind the board that the LCAP document is a three-year document and we are in year two. So we're looking at the same goals that we've had in the past and a few other um, similar things from the past that we'll go over. Um, we started collecting feedback for this um, LCAP, this year's LCAP in January. So since that time, we've been going out to stakeholders group and actually have come to the board to talk to you about those meetings. We've gone to DLACs and ELACs, all of our sites. Uh, Mr. Pinkerton and I have done presentations, our equity team, our common ground task force. We talked about student senate and the amazing feedback Feedback that they gave us. So over these months, we've been going to our stakeholders, trying to get feedback so that we can build a plan that serves our students, that has feedback from our teachers, and that our community and parents also give us feedback on. Um, I'm happy to say, and I think in large part to Mr. Mayfield's efforts and the efforts of ISLA, we received the most survey responses that we ever have. We received 729 responses this year, and we were a little over 600 last year and far below that in previous years. We had 505 parents respond, five community members and 219 staff members. And then because our LCAP really focuses on three groups, right? Our SED kids, our EL kids, and our foster homeless youth, we disaggregate our results that way as well. We had 147 families who identify as SED give us feedback. We also had 137 families who identify as EL give us feedback. And we had 18 families who said that they work with foster children or homeless children or homeless themselves and they gave us feedback. So really um, quite an increase from the um, previous years and a little bit more disaggregation this year. We're really trying to dig down deep and determine who is giving us what feedback as we're building this plan. Um, I talked about earlier in my opening comments, the LCAP advisory, and I can't forget their work. If you have 729 responses, then you have 729 surveys to go through. And that's what our LCAP advisory team does do. Mr. Mayfield has um, a meeting with them all of the information is shared in spreadsheets and they go over it in small groups and they put it together by theme areas. And I'll show you what they um, came up with as we go through this document in a couple of minutes. But I do wanna remind you of the three focus areas that we have in the LCAP. And you can see them right at the, the top of this, um, this document here. Number one, all students will achieve substantial academic gains through rigorous, relevant, and engaging instruction and curriculum. What we tell our teachers is that is every classroom across this district. What's going on in every classroom across this district? And then our second focus area is all LCAP identified subgroups will achieve substantial academic gains through a multi-tiered system of support. So now we're funneling down our focus. We're looking for kids in our subgroups and also those who are struggling academically or even socially, and we're trying to um, provide resources and supports for them. And then our third focus area is that um, we will create an intentional cultural of care that includes um, a focus on student emotional wellness and parent parent connectedness. So those are our three focus areas. And what is important for the board to know is this is in part your work. We look at the strategic direction that the Board of Education gives us, and we, we put together our focus areas in part based on that. It's also important to know that this really does trickle down. You see it on our LCAP, but it's also in our site 
SPSAs. So each of our sites are very aware of these three focus areas and they have action items in their single plans for student achievement. So then if I just go through um, this document right here, and Ryan, if you don't mind helping me just kind of slowly um, scroll down, you'll see that we've got our focuses and then our goals. The first green section is stakeholder input, and I will come back to that in just a minute or two. Um, we have three groups. You see we have feedback from students, parents, staff, and then uh, parent community, excuse me. So those three groups. And then if you keep going, Ryan, you're going to see, I think our next section is yellow and that's our outcomes or basically metrics. How are we um, looking at data to determine if we have met the goals that we um, have set for our students. So we're putting all these action items in our LCAP. We are attaching money to it. Somehow we have to be able to analyze how effective the program is, how effective whatever the action item is. And it's our metrics that help us with that. And then if you go down one more section, Ryan, this is our categories for actions. So I said that we have three focus areas. Under each of these three focus areas are broad categories for action. So strengthen teachers' depth of knowledge and support implementation of standards. Strengthen district-wide multi-tiered systems of support. Strengthen district-wide multi-tiered systems of support for individual needs and social emotional areas. Each of those broad categories will have action items under it, and that's where we have our expenditures attached. So focus area, broad action, and then action items to support that broad area. And then over it all is metrics to ensure that where we're spending our money is effective with our students and teachers. So Ryan, if you don't mind going back up to stakeholder input, this is the new part of our LCAP overview. Our action items and our metrics are mostly the same and were put together on the first year of our LCAP um, three year band and that was last year. But stakeholder input that's new every year. And this is the result of the um, groups that we've gone to over the last several months. And the themes that I was talking about are LCAP advisory identified. So I don't want to read every one of those to you, but I wanted to highlight a few things. So in stakeholder inputs, these are some of the things that our students told us. They want more diversity on campus. They want to be engaged with hands-on learning. They want summer programs, small group instruction, more counseling time, increased school spirit and community, regular check-ins for social emotional well-being, student voice on rules, many, many more things from them, but those are kind of highlights of what our students were telling us. From our parents, we hear small class sizes, strengthen the EL program, again, focus on hands-on and engaging learning, opportunities for extra support and enrichment, continue to expand our MTSS model, increase counseling, social emotional learning, increased behavior support from our parents. And then finally, from our staff, again, very thoughtful in their responses, small class sizes, strengthen phonics and spelling programs, and more intervention with support staff and individual instruction time, advisory periods at our secondary schools. Uh, let's see, more inclusion for SDC, increased counseling to include elementary, full-time elementary counseling. So just kind of a, a dipstick, if you will, of some of the um, feedback that we've received, but all of it is on this form here. So our next steps is to take this information and begin to build our LCAP, put in action items and attach expenditures that will support this stakeholder input. Mr. Mayfield, did I miss anything? Uh, no, not really. Uh, the only thing I would add is at the bottom section, if you could scroll down, Ryan, is these categories for action are directly linked to site SPSAs. So in the site SPSA, you'll see 
in uh, number one, category one or goal one, which would be rigorous, relevant instruction, they'll have uh, letter A, strengthen teacher's depth of knowledge. And then they have to outline the specific steps that they're going to take at their site in order to accomplish that. So the LCAP is directly linked to the single plans uh, so that we're aligned as a district from your goals, the board goals, to the LCAP to uh, site goals as well. And then the, what I would add is that I, in my experience of doing this now for four years, this is far, by far the most robust uh, feedback cycle that we've had. Uh, we're always looking for ways to, to get better at getting the feedback, especially from our impacted groups of English learners, socioeconomically disadvantaged and foster homeless youth. But uh, it was very robust cycle, a lot of uh, strong opinions and uh, good feedback that will help us to develop uh, the next uh, LCAP. I would also say that this year coming up is going to be year two of the three year cycle. So we would not anticipate wholesale changes. It's, it's mostly, uh, um, you know, tweaking and making some adjustments and then looking, you know, at the feedback as Mrs. Um, Frost said, looking at the feedback and incorporating that as best we can. Questions for board from board members right now. This is Frame. I haven't even turned on my mic. Um, yes, um, I don't know who to direct this to, and um, yeah, either one. But when I'm looking at the um, um, outcomes and the metrics for the multi-tiered academic support. And I see up at the top, it's you know related to mathematics and ELA and then inclusion. And then we get down to the dual immersion. I had a question um, when it says parent approval rating from parent survey Pacheco and Baywood 9010 models. And I'm wondering, since it's, you know, we're talking about um, academic gains is does that really relate to that because we're talking about parent approval so that's one question is I mean I, you know I'm not saying that it's it's not important but is it you sure. know kind of is it a metric that um, speaks to the goal yeah great question uh, I would say that all the other metrics apply to the dual language immersion programs as well wow. language arts mathematics everything right, right. and in addition we look at the survey results specific to those programs to garner, uh, you know, parent input in that. So that's just an additional metric for the dual language immersion programs. Okay. So the one thing um, that, and I, I thought I read it, but I, 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 could, I couldn't find it when I was rereading the document. What I am I'm looking for is, and wondering, do we have um, a metric for ELAP? you know, for the actual English language development, you know, the, the students take that test and do we have a metric of, you know, the annual progress of that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do for the LPAC. Okay. The, the English learner assessment. So would it, would it be something I'm wondering that would be, you know, as part of the broad outcomes to go into here? Or so the, I don't see the, it on right. The idea of the of the overview is mm -hmm. just to say we're going to use these metrics, and then the LPAC is listed as one of the metrics in the gold section in under uh, focus area one, under ELD. So students' performance oh, in ELD I'm as so measured sorry. by the LPAC. I'm and then so if you look in the LCAP, okay. those specific uh, metrics will be in there, both mm -hmm. both the performance from the previous year and the goal okay. for the current year. Okay, well, I appreciate it because I know I'd read it, yeah. but I just couldn't like it. It's is. a lot. There's a lot on these two okay. pages. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I have a question, just a more general question. Um, I, as the rest of the board members, were able to look at the voluminous responses that you got from the different groups. And from a process point of view, I'm curious, how is it that you are able to distill the information that you've got into these broad categories? Yeah. Great question. Uh, it's exhaustive. And not exhausting, and exhausting it's exhaustive. <laughs> uh, so the committee did a fantastic job, as Mrs. Frost mentioned earlier. Uh, we sent the data out to them uh, ahead of time and let people know, like, you're going to want to start reading this ahead of uh, the meeting because we have about two hours uh, to do this work where we look for patterns and kind of garner together what we're hearing uh, from the feedback. And then we spend two hours in that group uh, and we do it in small groups as Mrs. Frost indicated. 
uh, by focus area. And so they only have that piece of uh, data to look at. So it's reduced by roughly a third, uh, you know, not exactly, but roughly a third uh, of that number. And so uh, it's a little bit more manageable. Uh, and then we spend uh, at least a full day afterwards, or we did spend a full day afterwards, again, going through to make sure that what the uh, LCAP advisory committee came up with does indeed reflect the patterns that we see in that feedback. And then lastly, I would say we gave um, a special significance to EL feedback, SED feedback, homeless foster youth feedback, to make sure that those points that, that they gave us as feedback was reflected in this document here. So we spent a lot of time on it. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is it's a draft document. And so we still have some more time to spend uh, reviewing that and any changes that need to be made will be made. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we're hosting an event at Pacheco with the um, ELAC committee there, and we'll do a special activity to get in input from them. And if there's anything that is not already reflected from their input, we'll consider adding that as well. Mr. Buckman. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm increasing parent participation, um, and this is my thing. Um, sure. Oh, first, I have to admit, I missed it in Friday Focus. I was reading it separate days, so I have not read it, so this may be answered, and I apologize to you guys, because I'm sure you did a lot and I missed it, and I apologize. Um, however, 505, if I figure just the number of students, that's about 6.5% response rate, right? I'm not mad good at math. And so I, just so dear to my heart, is, is there just, is there some way to make a whole column in here that just says the next LCAP will just, just, spend a lot of time in outreach to parents. I know you, I, I've attended yeah. quite a few of the LCAP meetings, so I know you're trying hard, but I just, and then this, my second part of this question is of the 505, and you may have did this and I may have missed it. Is there a breakdown of um, secondary and primary and a breakdown of um, maybe subgroups? I don't know how you do that with parents unless you go back to their, to their children. And, and I don't know, and I don't know they self-identify. And mm -hmm. if we could get those numbers, it mm -hmm. would help me as well. Yeah, so we, we do have that data and we'd be happy to share that Thanks. with you. I would appreciate My it. favorite comment, Mr. Buckman, of all of them, and I read through these several times, I'm... And <laughs> is I don't know the answer. I'm only filling this survey out because you keep asking me to. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I shared that with Mrs. Frost and I said, look, <laughs> see, that's great. We um, are just starting to open back up with in-person meetings, and it's already on the radar for next year to, you know, design some activities to really bring people in and and get their input in this cycle. We want it to be better and better every year. Um, then, the, and I'll stop anytime another board member wants. There was also a comment in there that we're we're and I could find, we're going to we're going to have good CTA CTE programs. And just having been close to that a little bit, I think we have pretty good ones. So I think, you know, it's like, I was like, maybe improve, but maybe, I don't know. Um, let's see. The, other, the other question I have, we talk about outcomes, and I think I just heard the answer. In the sites, there's an actual like accountability, like we will improve by 5%. We will reach out and with next year, we'll have 10% parent response. Okay, so I don't know if those are general enough and I can't ask for the whole board, so we'll have to see. Um, but can, are those somewhat in common? Can we, can mm -hmm. we see? Because yeah. I'm always interested in, you know, you guys got the outcomes, you did all this right. work and then, three years, four years from now, it's like, did we, did we get there? Yep, that's all presented uh, to you in the LCAP, the budget action goals document, which will be in the May meetings. You'll see the metrics in there. And then each of the single plans for student achievement at site have that specific data. And uh, just this morning at the principal meeting, we went over some changes to the single plan, uh, including uh, having a meeting in May or late April uh, with the school site council to get their 
input on the progress that we've made in the in the goals that were outlined in single plan. So we shared with them a document today, a template for how to list all of the things in the single plan or the main things, and then get specific input from the school site councils as to uh, how we're doing so that that can be incorporated in next year's single plan. Thank you. Um, I think Mrs. Roger and then Mrs. Frame. Thank you. I did read through all of the information and um, it wasn't exactly reading War and Peace, but it was, it was a lot. And so at some point I started to just sort of um, scan a bit and look for things that popped out. And the things that did pop out both from parents from some students and certainly from staff um, was a call for additional counseling, additional nurse, nursing staff, um, additional aid support. And I know that those are all costs. Um, they all come with a, you know, a, a heavy price attached to them. But I'm wondering when you say that we're not, you don't anticipate that we'll be making anything other than sort of minor tweaks in the second year. Um, do you anticipate that we'll be responding to those requests at all? I, I do. I think if you look at this document, it, it just visually, it stands out how much feedback we got in the social emotional learning side of things. You know, sites have been tremendously impacted, as you know, uh, the students coming back and we do need to beef that up and increase it. So I do absolutely anticipate that we'll have some changes in that regard. Thank you. Mrs. Frame. Um, yes, I was wondering when when sites are doing their um, site plans, is there, um, for lack of a better term, a template that the district is provides to sites that um, you know within this realm of um, social emotional support, these are kind of choices or um, things we already have in place so that they're kind of not reinventing the wheel. And then there's some similarities. And of course, there's their site plan, so there'll be some differences. But tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, that's exactly what we do. We produce a template for each individual site, but it's based on this, the same metrics, the same uh, goals and whatnot uh, around the district. So that's given to the site. Then they, you know, make a copy of it, make it their own, and then they can additionally add on site specific actions and activities, but they will all have the basic outline and the template, as you mentioned, uh, to start with. Okay. Um, anybody else from the board before I go to the public? Okay, Mrs. Dawson, is there anybody from the public that would like to address us on this item? Okay, good. Uh, this is not an action item. Let's move on to 10.02, Student Support Services Update. And I believe that would be Mrs. Gould. Ms. Gould, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. I have to get to here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not popping up. Yeah. Okay. I don't see the Zoom. On the Zoom, right? Yeah. Oh. Uh, yes. This guy? Uh huh. All right. Send you a bill later. All right. Okay, now we're ready to go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Gould, Director of Student Support Services. I'm very happy to be here tonight, um, along with Chris Dowler. Uh, Joyce Hansen is in Zoom land this evening, not feeling at her best, but she's joining us as well. And I'm excited to be talking to you tonight about special education, social emotional learning, as well as attendance and discipline. So first I have a graphic organizer of what is student support services and student support services is over 300 employees in our district. Um, our counselors, our nurses, our program specialists, our school psychologists, our speech and language pathologists, our special education teachers, our amazing paraeducators. 
Um, just a, a, an amazingly outstanding group of people that I have just so enjoyed getting to know and work with this year in my first year in the student services department, um, a truly committed uh, and uh, professional outstanding group of people. Uh, each year, the state identifies uh, um, districts in terms of monitoring in two different areas. One is performance monitoring, and the other is in the area of compliance. When they look at performance, they're looking at, is your school district dis disproportionate in how they are identifying students for special education? So are we over identifying um, our English learners? Are we over identifying um, either as a whole population or are we over identifying students um, into specific programs or in terms of discipline. And what the state is saying is that in San Luis Coastal, we are not um, significantly disproportionate and we are not, it, it takes three years of monitoring to be significantly disproportionate. We're not even in year one. So that's great news. Thanks to Diane Frost and the amazing team before me and the, and the stellar work that they've done in the student services department. In, in terms of compliance, the state really focused on um, overdue and late initials and annual IEPs, which is not surprising following COVID and uh, the struggles that came with assessing students through distance learning and um, returning back to in-person um, uh, schooling. So there are different levels of monitoring um, and compliance within late and overdue IEPs. And the three different kind of categories that people can fall into is no action needed or technical assistance to, to help look at and dig into the data of late and over, uh, overdue IEPs and uh, optionally work with your local SELPA or technical assistance is required and you're required to work with a um, state identified SELPA to help improve in that area. And along with all of uh, the other uh, district, large uh, districts in our SELPA, we are in technical assistance optional and encouraging us to uh, work with local SELPA, which we already have scheduled to do. And this is something that um, we had identified early on just as the need to look at uh, late and over IED, overdue IEPs um, starting this year. So this is a process that I'm looking forward to being able to work with SELPA in how we are addressing these. So just an overview of some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight in the area of special education and SEL. We'll talk about staffing, student eligibility, least restrictive environment, co-teaching, and then URSIS. I'll explain what that is. And then with social emotional learning, we'll talk a little bit about MTSS, a care team update. Uh, counseling and additional student support. Um, I've given some next steps and then we'll hear from Chris Dowler in some areas. So the first thing I wanna talk about is our resource specialist program. And these are teachers that provide IEP driven special education instructional services to students who spend the majority of their school day in the general education classroom. So I have uh, the number of FTE that we have by elementary, middle and high school that support our resource program, the number of students and then the average caseload size for each of our teachers. 28 is the maximum caseload. At the elementary level, our teachers are running about 23 in the middle school as well, um, in high school uh, around 26. Uh, I also wanted to look at the experience of our special education teachers. And what I find is within resource, the vast majority of teachers do have experience in our district and, and as resource teachers. So three of our 29 total resource teachers were new to San Luis Coastal this year. Um, two of them have two years experience in San Luis Coastal and 24 of the 29 have been here three years or longer. Um, of the five that are new in the first couple of years, um, I want to say three of the five came to us with experience. The next group is our special day class. And these are um, for students who require a larger portion of their day spent um, in a smaller group size, smaller classroom and with a special education as a, a teacher, as their primary teacher. We have less intensive special day classes, more intensive special day classes. We have our counseling and rich program and we have one medically fragile class. Um, these uh, class ratios are much smaller. Uh, uh, the range of size in the elementary levels from five to 13, uh, in the middle school, four to 15, and at the high school, four to 13. Uh, this is where the experience level of our teachers changes. 
Um, of the 24 teachers that we have in our SDC classrooms, 10 of the 24 are new to San Luis Coastal and four of the 24 um, have been with San Luis Coastal for two years. So 14 of the 24 are within their first two years of teaching in San Luis Coastal. Um, about half, a little more than half of those are new teachers, new, new to the profession teachers. Um, so that's something that I'm gonna talk about, just the need to, for support for these teachers because we want to keep these teachers and we want to support these teachers um, because we know that these great teachers are going to provide great instructions and support our students. So when we look at, um, those are kind of, we have the resource specialist and we have special day class. What does our makeup look like throughout the district in those classrooms? So um, I'm also adding in, in this SLI, which is a uh, speech and language. So we have at the elementary level, about 32% of our students that just receive support for speech. Then about half are in that resource specialist program. So they are still spending the majority of their time in the general education classroom receiving support. And then we have about 14% in a less intensive special day class. 4% in a more intensive, and just about 1% of our students at the elementary level in our counseling and rich program. Mark. Hi. Uh, thanks, Janet. So when I looked at this, it's, you know, like the, the pie, right? So I looked at it and there's a bigger piece of pie in, in the, the, the secondary classrooms. And so I like, well, where does that, where does that come from? Are those kids coming forward? Really what's happening is, is, is it has to do with the speech and language impairment. So by the time kids are in seventh through 12th grade, it's I think one point, the, it's hot, my numbers are being hidden by the screen, it's about 1.8%, a very small number of students who are only getting speech language services in um, the secondary level. So they've already been either exited out of special education or they have a different disability. So they're no longer a speech only student. Now the vast majority are in a resource program. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Jen. I, you know, for me, it looked like, oh my God. So yeah, no, thank it, you very much. It's yes. And congratulations. Oh, thank you. But one thing, Janet, I, I think would be interesting at some point, and I'm not asking you to do this, is I just think, especially in um, elementary schools, we see a lot of students that receive both resource and speech. And I bet in in the secondary, it, there's some of that too. Probably not as much, and not for the same um, the same kind of, of eligibility. So I bet what we're seeing is articulation disorders, for example, are diminishing. <clears throat> excuse me, in the secondary, but we're still seeing students who are receiving speech and language support that supports their academic needs. We definitely are, yes. Uh, Mrs. Gould, I'm not familiar with CEP, but I'm wondering, is that the new acronym for ED? Yeah, uh, yes, for our therapeutic, we've called it in the past a therapeutic learning classroom um, for emotionally disturbed, yes. So we call it a counseling enriched program. Counseling enriched, thank you. Okay, this is just an overview um, from CBED's days from fall of 19 through fall of 21, showing our special education numbers and our numbers have uh, been increasing. And this is uh, on a percentage basis and it looks at um, individual schools. But when you look at individual schools, uh, I want to create caution in that um, we have uh, some of our schools that have more uh, special education classrooms, um, special day classes on their campus. So they have a higher population of students. You can't really compare one elementary school um, to another because this doesn't just look at like like to like resource to resource or it's in, including all special education students on a campus. Um, and then when we look at San Luis Coastal, we did increase by 1.4% from 2020 to 2021. And when we look at uh, Lucia Mar, the closest in size district, um, they are close to us at 14.2, but their increase over the year was less. They were at 13.9 and they went up to 14.2. 
When we look at slow SELPA, which is all of um, in our areas, uh, our, the LEAs in our area, um, including very small to very uh, to the largest, uh, the overall percentage of which we're included in is 13.8%. So this is a number that we want to continue to monitor. We wanna make sure that we're supporting our students and giving them the support that they need, but we also wanna make sure that we're doing that in the least restrictive environment. So to the extent that we can um, really intervene early and look at interventions through a multi-tiered system of support and support students prior to needing um, special education services, that's what we wanna to continue to monitor and look for. Janet. Sorry, Mrs. Ms. Gould, sorry. You can call me Janet. Okay, hi, Janet. Um, so I understand when we look at this by school site that, that we shouldn't pay too much attention, but it was, some of these were dramatic. And then I started to think, well, a percent, so Hawthorne has like, let's say 300 students. Uh huh. And so a percent of 300 is, is still a percent, the same, and it, but it could be the same percent as the high school where there's like 750. Right. So I don't know about the rest of the board, and, but somehow I, it would really help me to also see the student population. Actual numbers. Then I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be scared when I see, you know, Baywood at 19%, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then and you other, remember that Baywood has two special day classes on their right. campus, right? See, okay. So there you go. Um, and then I looked at um, Pacheco and I was like, whoa, are we... Are we under identifying? Is it because of the ratio that there's a, a lot of non SED kids going there that know. chose to go there? So that was that was a little that jumped out at me as well. Okay. Any any thoughts on well, that? Well, Pacheco, we do not have any of our um, any any of our special day class, which okay. would add to um, the population special education population on that campus. Oh. Uh, quick question, um, Ms. Gold. Uh, when when we're looking at the um, you know just like overall district picture, you know, and you know 2020 and 2021, and you know we are seeing kind of an upward trend, and all districts have gone through the you know the pandemic and COVID. So can you talk to me a little bit about what we are doing to kind of you know make sure we're identifying, but kind of monitoring? Um, you know we. I mean, if you just look at those numbers for 2020, um, where we were in comparison to other districts and then where we are now. Well, as, a school, as a school district, we're really looking at our multi-tiered system of supports. Hmm. So that's something that I'm going to point out in the next steps is um, something that I really want to continue to work on is a collaboration between student services and instructional services on what that, how we um, interact and relate with one another related to that multi-system uh, multi-tiered system of supports and the interventions that we have for best instruction, but also our tier two interventions and looking at expanding our tier two interventions. Again, making sure that we're able to meet the needs of kids in the least restrictive environment. Okay. Okay. This one looks at students in our district and you will see that 14.7% of our students uh, have an IEP and you're gonna like, wait, that's a little different than on the last mm -hmm. slide. That's because that number was pulled off of ARIES um, I think on Friday and the 14.4% was uh, a CBED stay back in October. So that's the, the difference in percentiles, just, just a little bit from 14.4 to 14.7. But this looks at, if you look at every student in our district um, from our TK to our 12th grade, 14.7% have an IEP. And then if you look at different groups, so our students who are not socioeconomically disadvantaged, about 10% have an IEP. Compared to students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, about 20% have an IEP. So we do see differences in the percentage um, of these subgroups uh, of students that uh, are receiving uh, a support, a special education support. Um, as I was saying earlier in the presentation, we are not considered disproportionate at the state. However, 
we do have, there is a difference in the percentage of students who are getting special education services. Um, I really like data and I, I had a lot of fun starting to dig into this data being that my first year in this position, I'm just learning about all this data. And when I look at the data, I get, I have more questions that I ask. So um, I'm very interested in digging into these numbers um, further. And uh, I know that the numbers will help paint a picture um, to which we can then take action on. So thank you, thank you, Ms. Cole, for the, the conversation about this, because this chart, when I, you know, when I looked at the comment underneath that it, it said there, there was really kind of only a, a 5%, you know, um, you know, difference. Um, it's, it's true if we're comparing it to all the students, but when I was looking at this, I was reading um, that SED is really not the targeted group. And so that number is 10%. And so everything else really should be comparing to, you know, 20.8 to 10 and 20. Oh, so it's, it's not the 5%, it's really kind of a 10%. And then as you said, you know, you begin to think data and questions. And so then I started thinking, okay, if, if our, you know, our SED population is, you know, you guys can correct me on the numbers because I don't know, a little over 30%, but where SED is 20%, that seems like we're, you know, identifying lower. But when we get to EL, it says, you know, 20% of our, um, you know, our special ed, our EL, but they only represent kind of 9% in our district. So that's, you know, as you said, data has, you know, we have data, but questions, and even if the state, you know, doesn't consider, it just seems kind of wonky. And I, I, so it, I may, I may not be reading it correctly, but, um, and then when I, you know, and then I went further over to kind of the white group, and that's 13.1, but they represent in our district, like, Correct me if I'm wrong, 68% or so I, or I don't know what they that do. Is. Well, I think what you're looking at is you're looking at if, if, if special ed was a hundred percent, what percentage of special ed are each of those populations? Mm -hmm. What this is looking at is if the group is a hundred percent, so all is a hundred percent or English learners are a hundred percent, what percent of our English learners are special education? So I kind of went back and forth and how to look at it. I thought the most accurate way to look at it was if I'm looking at all of our students and 14.7% of uh -huh. our students are special education students. Mm -hmm. And then I look at a hundred percent of our English learners. And I say, what percentage of our English learners are special education students? So I think we have a hundred and, and I didn't do the math. I think we have 155 um, uh, English learners who are special education students. Mm -hmm. If I take 155 and I divide it by right, right. 1239, I think right, it is right, our total right. number of special ed. It's it's closer in relationship to our percentage of EL students in our district. Right. But do you see where it, and I mean, it is, it's con confusing. And then, you know, and that the number really, the comparison number is really kind of the SED and not the total because statistically when you pull them all back in it. So exactly. I think it, 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 you know, I, I don't know if this, you know, I, I, if this, if this, you know, the state, you know, has as, you know, perhaps um, mm -hmm. good of good of benchmarks as we need to, but I really appreciate kind of the, the, you know, these numbers and also the thinking that, okay, digging deeper and diving deeper, because, you know, that's really what we're trying to find out. So thank you. Yep. So Jen, on the same chart, um, I may be really naive on this. So if, when I look at SED, 20%, when I look at English learners, roughly 20%, Hispanic, roughly 20%, is, I don't know, is it a term disaggregate? So is it possible that any of these students are duplicated? Yes. Is most, that affecting? Yes. These that's why they're so similar? Um, I would say it's definitely why it's so similar in English and Hispanic, because right. most, the majority of our English learners are Hispanic. Um, but with socioeconomically disadvantaged, we have students who are not Hispanic, you know, the significant number that are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Okay, so, so that 
That's but there are like students who are students who are in the socioeconomically disadvantaged group are can also be in the English learner group, can also be in the Hispanic group. So the, the only two that are really like you're only in one group or the other is the SED or not SED. Right. Right. I mean, but our if students who are, um, you know, white students can be in the SED group or they can be in the non-SED group. Right. Same with our EL, same with Hispanic. And and then um, again, if the board or whatever, if it's not that difficult, there's a couple of other subgroups like black. And if we, if I could just see those and I know it's a percent of a, per, yeah, a percent. Yeah, it's a smaller percent, but yeah, right. I certainly can. And then I, I kind of walked away with this and I, again, I could be totally wrong, but it looks to me like you might be able to make a generalization that household income, it could be the food, it could be getting services when a student is much younger. Am, am I making or any kind of a wrong assumption here that, or is that just one of many assumptions that could be made? I don't know that I can answer that. I'm sorry. Pretty good. That was diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this looks at initial assessments. How many students are we looking at for special education eligibility? And I'm gonna try and move my graph a little bit. So uh, this year, as you would expect, the majority of the assessments that we've done on students have come at the elementary level or, or earlier. Um, people are three to five-year-olds. That's what we want. We want to early identify early and provide students with the support that they need. And um, discontinue them and back into in general education or continue support depending on each student's individual needs. Uh, we have about 5% of middle school were identified and eight and a half percent of high school. But when you also, when you think of middle school and high school, you have two or three grade levels at middle school and four grade levels at high school. So it's, it's you know, the number of students is similar. Um, but our eligibility rate in preschool is at 78%. So 78% of the students that we assess are found eligible for services. Uh, in elementary, it's at 82%, 75% in middle school and 70% um, at the high school level. So uh, we have found 151 students eligible for special education this year. And um, as of last Friday, there were 50. And when I looked today, there were 56 um, students who are pending eligibility. And that's one of the things about special education. And you don't, you don't have static numbers. The numbers are, are always changing. Um, but just for a little bit of comparison, last year we had um, 116 who were found eligible. So we are, um, we are increasing in the number of students um, that we're finding eligible for special education services. So there are um, 13 different eligibility categories some ways that students can be found eligible for special education services. And this graph shows um, in our district of 100% um, how, what that looks like. So a speech language impairment at 27.9%, um, specific learning disability, uh, one out of three, students with autism, 12.7% other health impaired, and then significantly smaller for the other um, eligibility categories. And then we wanna look at this and we wanna look at it compared to um, uh, other districts in our area. So that's what this chart does where each bar is 100%. So in San Luis Coastal, um, I, I, I tried to blow up the different eligibility categories a little larger for, um, the first six so that you could see them. Uh, speech and language impairment, you'll see in the blue, followed by specific learning disability, other health impairment, emotionally disturbed, autism, intellectual disability, and then uh, much smaller levels, uh, percentages for the other um, eligibility categories. So you'll see that when you look at San Luis Coastal compared to Lucia Mar, um, Paso Robles, Atascadero, and Selpo Wide, that Percentage-wise, we're um, identifying similar percentages. We're maybe a little higher in speech and language, um, but other than that, with the other eligibility categories, um, we're pretty similar. So then the question comes up, why speech and language? Um, and I don't have the final answer to that yet. It's it, This data raised that question. It's something that um, I want to continue to dig into and get an answer for. So when we talk about students and being served in special education, we talk about the least restrictive environment. 
And that's maximizing the amount of time that they get to spend in their general education classrooms. So this, this is something that's monitored by the state. And we have data here that dates all the way back to 2013, 2014. And the first one um, looks at how many of our students spend over 80% of their day in the general education classroom. So this is a number that we want to see go up. So from 13-14, we were at 45.4%. We continued to increase. Last year, our high was 64.21%. This year, we're down to 63%. So it's close. It's gone down a little bit. It is, um, I don't think, surprising to anyone that after the pandemic that we've had, that kids have more need. And so we're responding to that need. So even though it's down a little bit, I'm not gonna say it's a bad thing because we're responding to needs that are being, you know, our case managers are working hard and responding to needs that they're identifying. Um, the, the state has a target of 62%. We're still um, slightly above the target at 63%. The next one looks at um, what percentage of our students who are in gen ed for less than 40% of their day. So this is the number we want to be smaller. So as far back as 13, 14, we had 22% of our students. We're now down to 16%. So this is maximizing inclusion opportunities, especially for students in our special day class, giving them opportunities to um, be a part of a general education classroom um, with uh, typical peers. So we were at 13.23%. Again, with pandemic, we're up to 16% this year. So that's an increase. Um, we're still uh, slightly be below the state's target of 16.5%. And the next graph, I show um, a visual representation of that. So the blue line represents students who are um, in uh, gen ed 80% or more of their time. And that's the line we want to go up, right? And the orange line indicates students with less than 40% of their time in the regular classroom. And that's the line that we want to go down. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about co-teaching in secondary, and this has been a big growth curve for me this year. Um, as you know, I'm elementary for the last 27 years in this district, but I um, sure have had fun uh, getting to enter and learn more about the secondary field. And, and co-teaching is really the model that um, is mainly used in secondary to support our um, special education students. And in this model, you have a, um, a a core teacher, a content area teacher who's working either with a special education teacher or um, a highly trained peer educator under the direction of a special education teacher. And what that's doing is it's allowing um, special education students to receive um, general education curriculum in their gen general education classroom um, with support. So with accommodations, with curriculum uh, that is, um, modified or accommodated in order to support them in success in their general education classroom. Um, so uh, they benefit from the opportunity, students benefit from the opportunity to be with their general education peers. And I saw Evelyn reaching for the mic. Um. Thank you, Ms. Gold. Um, I, I appreciate this explanation because it's it's you know a model that I'm I'm seeing you know when I'm I'm going to sites. One thing I'm I'm curious is is how, what is the process because it seems like this is heavily dependent on collaboration between that general education teacher and special education teacher. So what does that look like for our teachers? What's that? formalize collaboration process that, I mean, does it, you know, to support, you know, this really important process and for it um, to be successful, it really, I would assume really hinges on that collaboration. So right. It's, what are we? It's a good question. We've done, we've brought um, SELPA in to do training for our co-teaching partnerships. Um, and they, you know, with the master schedule, they don't all have co-aligned prep times that they have for collaboration. We do um, provide, they do have the ability to take some release time for collaboration, but I, that's another area of focus. Oh, and Joyce is raising her hand. So Joyce can speak into this as well. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm not there tonight. Um, but our co-teachers also get time in the summer before school starts and they meet um, as teams in the summer before school starts. 
in the last two summers, we've been fortunate to have Trish Lamino from SELPA supporting our code teaching pairs. And she has continued that training this year, more of a high school um, working with the code teaching teams there in ongoing training. Um, so we are supporting them that way and, and giving them additional release time to meet and do that planning, which is so important to the partnership. So, so do we have, um, uh, I guess, uh, so in order for, um, I guess, what would we, since this is a, you know, the model that we're attempting, well, not we're attempting, but we have, you know, excellent teachers and, and, and co-teachers doing that. What is the area of need that we need to kind of just, you know, to continue because this really um, is an important delivery piece. And, you know, I think it's really good to do it beforehand, but, you know, that ongoing. So what you're saying is the teachers need, will have to get release time, which means they would need substitutes from their class, which means, do we have any other way of doing, of doing that? Um, that so teachers aren't missing, you know, <laughs> time with their, with their other students or, I, I, you know what, and, and I apologize because it's just, uh, it's just when I'm looking at this model and, and, and seeing it, it seems like a really powerful model. Right. So, um, no, it's a good question. Okay. Joyce, do you have more that you want to add to this based on the last question? Oh, I'm sorry. Is that feeling? Oh, sorry about that. No. Um, no, okay. I, I know that we're always working with the co teachers. And one of the things that they've talked about over and over again is as much as possible in that master planning if they can get their prep periods, at least one prep period aligned with their co-teaching partners, that's helpful. Um, and so that's just working with the school sites and making sure that that happens in their master planning. Tough, tough to do, okay, yeah, thank you. But that's really... So this one looks at the different co-teaching sections that we have. So we have it divided out by English, math, science, and social science. It's San Luis High, Morro Bay High, Laguna Middle School and Los Sosos Middle School. So if you were to read this down for English, we have six co-taught sessions, 48 students with IEPs in those six sessions. So about eight per class. So altogether, we have 64 co-taught sections and there's 528 IEPs served in those 64 session, or sections. Um, we have 533 students with an IEP in our secondary. The numbers, it's, it's you can be a special education student who has a co-taught English class, so you may be counted there, and you could also have a co-taught science class, so you may be counted there. So because we have 528 IEP served, that's not five, necessarily 528 students. Does that make sense? So the next has to do with URSUS and this kind of, I have this right before we go into social emotional learning. So URSUS is educationally related social emotional supports and services. So these are um, students that need uh, a tier three counseling support provided by our school psychologist to help them access their education. So it looks um, for the most part uh, like weekly counseling with our school psychologist. And this is an area that we've seen some pretty dramatic increase um, over this past year. And again, not surprising with uh, what we're hearing about the needs of students in returning from the pandemic, but we've had an increase of 15 students that um, this year from what we projected that are needing that level of services, um, 10 students at middle school and 18 at the high school. So overall, we've had a 47% increase this year in the students that um, are accessing this level of support. Don't know at this point if this is um, a response to you know a significant need identified over the pandemic, or if this is you know if this is a one-time response, or if this is going to be an ongoing trend. Um, I can't answer that at this point now, but it definitely is um, a significant increase in uh, a level of support. Um, we have absolutely amazing school psychologists in our school district that um, have really stepped up into the role um, of URSUS counseling over the last few years as I think it's been three years that San Luis Coastal has taken this back from um, like County Mental Health. Uh, and uh, these are um, just amazing people that really enjoy working with kids and supporting kids and um, really enjoy putting on 
this part of the hat in addition to all of the assessments that they do. So Janet, um, is, this, is this individual counseling that's done outside of the classroom or are we also seeing an increase in the number of our students in our counseling enriched program? We are seeing a number, an increase in the number of students in our counseling enriched program. Um, but we're, what we're really looking at with that is can we find a way to support students counseling needs again in the least restrictive environment so if you're going to be in a counseling enriched program does that need to be your classroom for the whole day or can you be in the counseling enriched program for a period or two where we're supporting um, you know mental health needs yet pushing students out into classrooms with their general education peers to the maximum extent possible. So we're looking at maybe instead of a counseling enriched program, more of like a counseling enriched class. Um, so students are receiving that support for a portion of their day, but not necessarily the entire day. And how do our school psychologists coordinate treatment with say, um, out with say psychiatrists and outside therapists and things like that? It seems like a pretty, it seems like some case management um, really some strong case management needs as well. It definitely would be. I mean, we're looking for releases of information. And um, I, I was in an IEP today where one of the first questions that our school psychologist asked was, you know, what outside services does uh, your child receive? I wanna make sure that I have accurate information so that I can follow up on that. So then moving into social emotional learning, we've talked about multi-tiered systems of support. You've heard about it for academics, and, and I know this has been shared with you previously in terms of social emotional learning. But when we look at a pyramid, if there's if there's strong things that we do for all of the students, then there will be fewer students that need that tier two intervention and even fewer students that need a tier three intervention. So when we look at our, our solid foundation, we're looking at our school counselors, we're looking at our second step SEL curriculum. We're looking at things like the leader in me at Monarch Grove. We're looking at parent grade level workshops and presentations, but we're looking at, you know, building that strong relationship with um, the teacher and the students in the classroom and things that they're doing kind of classroom wide to support our students. When we look at tier two, we're looking for fewer students um, needing this level of support. It could be small group counseling. It could be a check-in check-out system. Um, using our family advocates um, to support our families, looking at um, restorative interventions and restorative discipline. And then when we talk about our fewest level of students, we're talking about, um, again, this URSUS level of supports or uh, therapeutic intervention 504 plans. But this has been a tough year. You've heard it said it came through very loud and clear in the survey. Um, and it's not anything that I don't think was, I, I think, we knew coming back from COVID that it was gonna to be tough and it, it has been a tough year. Janet, sorry. Um, I'm enthralled with MTSS. I, I get it now. Um, is it, are, are, there, is the, are there opportunities for students to sort of drive maybe a discussion group or is there an opportunity for, let's say, um, let's say everybody's spray painting the school. Is there, and so kids are getting suspended. Is, this, is there like a, a nexus between MTSS and, and some kind of counseling or group counseling? Does that happen? Does it happen or can it happen? I'm not sure that I'm completely understanding your question, but sure. what I can tell you just from my time as an elementary principal, that anytime that you have a problem, if you bring the kids into being part of the solution, right. um, they buy in okay. and it it's very powerful. And so, it, Okay, so I guess that's a question. so like yeah, so a like our different the future, right? right? Well, in our different schools, so like you look at like your 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 student councils that exist on your elementary schools, and obviously in your ASBs and your middle and your high school, but definitely through student voice, and then you know as a district with our student senate, those are the type of things where we want to empower our students to empower yeah. one another. So maybe there's so maybe there's a lot of suspension because kids are I don't know texting during class, right? Okay? And it seems to be maybe becoming endemic. Um, does MTSS can that sort of be shifted and, and talk about you know the the value or why are you doing that or what's driving that? Right, anything that you're seeing that's on a school wide basis, mm -hmm. definitely you want to look okay. at like what can you do 
that gets to everyone, okay. right? So that's, that's supporting tier, to everyone. That's, so that would be your tier one, tier right? One. What yep. can we do that that everyone needs? It's supporting the needs of all. Great. Okay. Thanks. You have one of Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, when I looked at this model, is this um, kind of a dynamic model? Do kids can they you know they you know they start at the bottom if they need to go up or they can go back down? It's yep. kind of dynamic. Kind Definitely. Of, okay. That's, okay. Thanks. Yeah. We want it to be dynamically down. That's our goal, right? But have the supports when we need to go up. And so we've built in San Luis Coastal our, our model based on how can we address a multi-tiered system of supports. Um, and one of the things that um, we've talked about in the past are our care teams, collaborate, affirm, restore, and educate. And these are teams that um, are uh, at each of our elementary or each of our sites throughout the district. There's that elementary person in me coming out. Um, and sites are uh, teams that include our school counselors, our administrator, our nurse, family advocate, school psychologist, program specialist. And they're teams that meet together on a regular basis, monthly or every other week, where they get together and they talk about students. And they look at trends and they look at needs and they share resources that are available based on um, the needs that are being identified. We introduced Sabres as a universal screener this year, and the um, care teams looked at the data and responded based on the data that they saw. Um, just work on uh, this year as well, we created a district care team. So we have school counselors, um, a school nurse, school psychologist that are right now um, attending a trauma-informed practices workshop series and uh, coming together and generating ideas to share back with us for um, ways to further develop and refine the model that we have. And, so, and then on the last one that's here in tier one is parent grade level workshops and presentations. So I'm wondering if there's, a, you know, is that, what's our favorite word? Is that a robust program at this point or is it developing? I could say it could be more robust. Okay. Thanks. And really we need to take advantage. It's like when you talk about like the COVID lessons, that's one of the things we need to take advantage of is, you know, we can do um, virtual um, lessons. And I mean, we sent, we sent out something today um, that went out to people regarding um, like uh, some a Facebook talk on like suicide prevention and, and parents and making them aware of um, like signs to look for and how you can support your children. So we're trying to take advantage and we've got Shelly Benson in the lead counselor position, who's uh, amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, finding these resources and then we're sharing them out with parents. There you go. Okay, that's different than when I first turned it on. Okay, thanks to the tech team for turning that on. So um, the question is, can this be observed or is it too personal? And um, are, are they in, involved in civic discourse learning and how to communicate and those things that we have as overall goals? So our social... Our, our social emotional learn. I'm I'm sorry. I'm not. Under, can can what be observed? Can like the, the SEL lessons? Or are we on the care teams? Yes, like the second step program and the different programs that were definitely since when I was a teacher up to too late. 2018. Yeah, um, we've been doing second. I mean, I think different, different, different schools, different districts have have approached this different differently. Um, I've been I was doing social second step lessons, a different version of it. 20 years ago, Mary Evelyn, you probably were too. Um, but yeah, Second Steps did just come out with a new digital version this year. Um, and, uh, but we have been doing Second Step lessons on our campuses, but you definitely are welcome to come in and observe Second Step lessons on our campus campuses. Um, some of our campuses uh, school-wide are doing different mindfulness practices um, to kind of get the kids back in a, in a frame ready to learn when they come back in from recess or when they're getting ready to take a, take a, a test, which there'll be a lot in this high stake test that'll be coming up in May. Um, but yeah, you, you're definitely welcome to come out to okay, the school is sites. There a particular place that you would direct me? Shall I talk? Yeah, let's, let's about talk about afterwards. Okay. Yeah. We'll do it. I've got a lot of experience with one of our schools. <laughs> Janet, are these care teams the same as SSTs or is that something separate? No, it's something separate. So our SST, okay. 
So when we look at the, the supports that we have, we have kind of our, our, our amazing school counselors at the elementary, middle, high school level. Um, and of course, Shelly Benson, who's taking the lead counselor role. Um, we also have a layer of intervention, um, therapeutic interventions that we have done through contract agencies with community counseling and Slow County Behavioral Health. We have 18 part-time um, mental health support counselors who are assigned to our 15 students. And this year they're serving our 15 sites. And this year they're serving 147 students. So what that looks like is anywhere from a half an hour to an hour a week of um, uh, therapeutic support for students that are identified as needing um, uh, counseling support services. So our, um, our counselors are absolutely amazing and they do just a wonderful work at our school sites, so just such important work um, with supporting the social emotional learning that's happening at the schools, doing group counseling. Um, their, their credential does not enable them to do therapy. That's outside mm -hmm. of their credential. Um, where then some of these uh, therapeutic interventions that we bring in are MFTs or MFTs that are in training um, who are coming in and doing their hours here for us. And we can offer a different level of support than what we can offer from our counselors. Um, uh, just a quick question, Janet. When I look at the um, you know 4.7 counselors serving 3,710 students, that's the total number of students at our elementary sites. Do right. we... You know, and that's true for all those numbers. Do we have, you know, when we're looking at LCAP and needs, do we have an indication? And I'm sure you have of kind of their caseload, and I'm not talking like student contact, but you know, the number of students approximately. Um, you know, the counselors are you know responsible for, and I, I'm sure that's yeah. kind of fluid, right? It and so it, be it definitely is, and and counselors do take you know they do put information into Aries our system, mm -hmm. and when they when they work with students, and I know that that type of information has been shared out with the board previously, as like in past years, as far as mm -hmm. like how many count contacts that they've had for different areas, um, you know, okay. just on average we have fifty or sixty percent counselors uh, this year at our Title One schools, and about forty percent at our nine non Title One schools. Okay. So two to three days a week. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this year we said it was tough. And one of the things we had some sites come to us and say, we're just really having a hard time. We're having a hard time with just even managing some lower level behaviors um, or these lower level behaviors. What they're doing is they're interfering with our counselor's ability to address some of the higher level behaviors um, or higher level needs. And uh, our district was, I think, very responsive in um, instituting these um, SEB, social emotional behavior monitors at our um, K through eight level who are coming in. And um, these, are, these are people that are supporting just the lower level needs across the campus. So being an, an extra set of eyes out on the playground, um, students that just, they, they need to go for a walk, the little ones, and you're just taking them on a, a five minute walk um, to help regulate them, to get them back ready to learning. So we're not talking about really super significant issues. We're just talking about kids that need help regulating and getting back to being ready to learn. And these um, SEB monitors this year have been um, a valuable uh, support for that. We, we recently surveyed campuses and said like, you know, how, how did you feel about the use of this? And they were overwhelmingly um, positive about the help that they had this year. But then we asked like, how are you feeling about needing moving forward? And some were like, yes, I love it. I want to go on. But some are like, no, thank you for responding. It really was, you know, things have started to settle down. And, um, you know, it was, it was a very needed support at a very um, challenging time. Um, but things are starting to settle down a bit. So, so the, I'm, I'm, the family advocates, they actually, I, they, to the funding for that, um, do you know roughly what the budget is? Maybe Chris? Chris probably does. I know yeah. He, yeah, he, we have two that are grant funded, right, Chris? Our yeah. family, advocates. family advocates. Yeah, it's a mix of grant funding and uh, LCAP funding. LCAP okay. funding. Okay. It, is any of that... Did we get a like a little boost maybe from one time COVID funding or did we? Well, I think we had three family advocates last year and we have four family advocates okay. this year. So we okay. do have four family advocates and they have just done oh yeah, amazing work. Yeah. 
Um, they've had 60, 655 referrals this year as of March 25th, uh, 275 of which are mental health referrals. They've participated in 21 safe meetings and safe meetings are uh, meetings that are held that bring together like all the resources in the county um, when families are struggling and talk about what the struggles are and different resources in our county that can support um, our students. Uh, they've been sources of financial assistance, $24,000 in grants to families. Um, a lot of that coming from our educational um, foundation and, the, and the, the funds that were set up through that to support families. Um, they've connected with 176 families in transitions this year. So just absolutely valuable um, members of our uh, social emotional team to support uh, our families. T t tell us what family and families in transition. Families in transitions are not, uh, you, like you think homeless families, um, but families in transition. So they could be homeless. They could be um, under housed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So just uh, last a couple little quotes from uh, two of our principals about our SCB monitors and the support they've had at their campus. Our SCB monitor has created a space called our mindfulness shed where students can relax and take a break. She works with students in a garden setting to resolve friendship issues, mediate playground problems and help when someone is just having a hard day. And then the other one, Ms. Unimar, our SCB aide, has been such an integral part of our school community these past few months. Since she's on campus every day, she has been a constant force of support for all grade levels. She knows every student pops in to give breaks, supports in the classroom, jumps in to help wherever needed. We're so lucky to have her a part of our Stinger team. That's okay. from and just, just, just to be sure, all, all school sites have access to an SCB? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, K through eight. Okay, and I've already kind of mentioned some of, as I've gone through some of my next steps moving forward, um, just the importance to recruit and retain special education teachers. Um, hire early, we're currently in process. We've already um, hired a couple of um, special education teachers for next year with experience coming forward. And um, uh, one of them who will be in one of our LISDC classrooms was a student teacher with us this year. And we're really excited to have him um, moving into uh, one of our special day classes. Um, we are also using some one-time special education money to bring on a 50% uh, special education TOSA. Uh, this was approved earlier uh, this year by the board, really with a focus of supporting our teachers. Um, and they do have tough jobs and they do have heavy caseloads. Um, and there's a lot to manage and, and you know, the, the teaching is the primary. <laughs> we, need, we need them to, uh, you know, really focus on the teaching as well, and they need support. So um, that 50% SPED TOSA is, I, I believe, really going to help um, with monitoring and supporting and retaining um, and making them feel they support that they, they have the support that they need uh, in our district. Uh, we have the Special Education Leadership Council um, uh, with, which is a representatives of different um, special education and um, school psychologists, speech pathologists in our district, and really just continuing to hear what their concerns are and collaborate with them on solutions to support um, special education teachers in our district. Talked about the data and just continuing to monitor and analyze eligibility trends and that data and have that data tell stories that then we can um, take action on. And really just the continued development of MTSS. And I kind of chuckled and felt like, okay, I'm, I'm on the right track here because I had put down collaborative practices between ISL and student support services, really with that focus on both the academic and social emotional trends of, of uh, tiered levels of support. And then as I was reading through the LCAP survey that kept coming up again, even specifically like how is student services and ISLA really um, communicating and collaborating with one another around this area. So that's definitely something um, that I want to continue to work and develop as we move forward. Okay. So with that, I'm going to invite um, Mr. Dowler up to talk about attendance and discipline. I'm doing my best, <laughs> not gonna lie. All right, let's go. Can we see this? All right, well, oh, present, thanks. There's so many buttons. I know. 
so much going on. All right, student attendance and discipline um, update. All the data that I'll present here is trying to show apples to apples. So that means the same time frame from one year to the next. Um, it's a little difficult because last year was an orange, right? So it's going to be really hard to compare, you know, attendance and discipline data to that. But it is part of the picture. So I try to go back as much as like three years. I need to go back, sorry. All right, I'll start with this slide. This shows student uh, discipline entries through January 31st. So again, um, this is comparing 1920 data because that is the last like-to-like -like comparison, right? So this is every time a school administrator has a disciplinary um, interaction with a student, um, they make a log entry. So 1920 for the um, up through January 31st, we were in school. So it's the last apple to apple comparison to this current year. So as you can see, um, this measures the outcomes of that interaction. So in 2019, 2020, we had 166 other means of correction. This year we've had over 592. That's just through January 31st. So that is the number of times that our school administrators interacted with students around a disciplinary issue and did not suspend them. They did something else. So whether that's a restorative measure, that's whether that's a parent teacher conference or a parent administrator conference, whether that is you know, an admonishment, whether that is a behavior contract or consulting with a teacher or a counselor, they did something else. Um, 164 of those times, so up through January 31st, they suspended a student. Um, and then 17 of those times it was in school. So you can see the comparison. We were up through January 31st um, compared to 1920. Uh, it was 135 out of school suspensions to 164 now. So we're definitely up. Mr. Dollar, on this chart, if I can, Mr. Stronger, do you think a, a bit of a, pro, a a bit of the reason for that is Aries versus Power School? Is it easier to put in information with Aries? Do you think administrators are charting more than maybe they did in the past, or you really think that everything's up three to four times more in terms of students? No, I think some of it is Aries. I couldn't tell you why. I mean, Power School is pretty simple to enter, do log entries too. We also have a new group of administrators that log a lot. I think it's just more uniformly utilized, uh, particularly at the elementary level. So a good portion of that might be elementary. Yeah, I, but I think it, I think some of it is, has to do with Aries, but not all of it. It's been a busy year. Chris, yeah, I appreciate, I so appreciate this data and it seems like it's pretty easy to gather. So when they make these entries, do they make it by subgroup as well? You can disaggregate it you like can. that. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's pretty much a click, click, and we can disaggregate it, right? Well, I'd have to Maybe explore that. It might be more than a click, click. Okay. All right. Um, thanks. Not to be snide. I just, no, 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 no. I or just, glib. You know, That's I, right. I work, I work with spreadsheets. And I'm not being glib. I, just, I work with spreadsheets, and sometimes it's pretty easy. Yeah, know? it might be. I'd have to explore the query. So, yeah. Mr. Dowler, I, yeah. the out-of-school suspension data, um, the difference, it looks to me, it's about 25%. Yeah, increase. more or less. Yeah, I think so. That sounds about right. I know we were up 40% just in the middle schools. 40%. In okay. suspensions at the middle schools. Yeah, middle schools have been hopping. Elementary was flat compared to 1920. I don't know if that's still the case. And then high schools were up around 20-ish percent. So the middle schools are really where we had the biggest increase in disciplinary incidents for sure. I'll get into a breakdown on that because that's super yeah, interesting. I think it's coming, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> got to keep it light, man. I, I deal with some grim subjects, so I'll keep it light. Um, you, as you can see, this is m measuring what the suspension codes were for that hundred and whatever amount of suspension. So. 85 of which were for fighting, 48900A code, whether that's A1, A2, that's either mutual fighting or an assault or a threat. 
or 8400A1 could be a threat too, but that is ser seriously warrants, uh, you know, some sort of out of school suspension. So 85 compared to 45 in 1920. Again, I'm trying to compare apples to apples here. So I'm going in the same time frame to our last school year where we were all in school in person all day. So you can see we're up in fighting, down in drug and alcohol suspensions, uh, down in bullying, up in obscenity, um, a little bit up in vandalism, but really down in a lot of categories, except for fighting and violence. So Chris, it, um, are these numbers, could it be, are these discrete students or could one student have been in four fights? I think I did it one, these were just incidents. So these were just suspensions. It okay, wasn't so it could be individual students. Student so you who, could have one really active student. Right, and I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's not, we don't have one student who's been in 85 fights, but I know no. historically we have had students who have maybe been in trouble a That's few times. Yeah, I would say when you look at the fighting category, you're really not gonna get past a couple. Okay, but that was then just using that as an example, but some of the others, it could be. Yeah, yeah you, could have, you could have a few duplicate students okay. in that 85 for sure. Okay. And, and just before I forget, would it be possible to send this to uh, Mandy and she can share it with us? Oh yeah. Thanks, it's I appreciate it. Say it again. It's linked on my, my presentation. It is, yeah. I missed it. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, I think this is um, also replicated when I talk to other people who do what I do in other school districts. This is actually really similar to what they're going through in other school districts up and down the state. And I think you are, this is reflective of where our society is right now. All right, what is this? Expulsions through January 31st, much smaller decrease, but this is well within the means, like this is well within an average. So this isn't a deviation, you know, normally in any given school year, we'll have anywhere from, you know, seven or eight expulsions to 20. I like to be somewhere below 20. And I think this we're on a healthy path right now in terms of our expulsions. Um, percentage of students, this relates to absenteeism. So the percentage of students missing more than 10% of school through January 31st, predictably is up. Sorry, Diane, I missed this number earlier today. Uh, but yeah, over 30% of our kids have missed 10% or more of school through January 31st. So that is a really high degree of absenteeism and that is directly related to COVID restrictions. And this is very common up and down. Um, the county and the state, you know, COVID restrictions have continued to keep students out of schools for long periods of time. All right. And as a result, our average daily attendance took a significant hit this year. So normally we're at around, you know, the high 97%. That's kind of gold bar attendance right there, right, Dr. Prater? And so normally we're right there through January 31st. And this year we were down to less than 92%. But again, this is super common. As I've talked to my colleagues up and down the county, all of them are dealing with really high absentee rates and very low average daily attendance. So this is the percentage of students enrolled in our schools that are attending on any given day on average. And I guess that's it. Okay, is that the end of the presentation? Well, thank you. Um, let's go to the public and see if there's anyone from the public that would like to comment on this item. Seeing no one, um, are there any further questions from board members or comments? Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Gould and Mr. Dowler. Sure. We really Thanks appreciate so this Thanks. really deep dive into the student services, student support services. Um, there's a lot going on there and, and we really appreciate the hard work that you guys do. So thank you very much. You. Okay, item 10.04. I see that we have Mr. Holcomb who's been an, another patient person. This is a measure D uh, design build modification number 10, setting the GMP for San Luis High building 100 
the North Modernization Program. Just gonna pull it up really quick. So we are in the, no, I think I'm all right. I was gonna share it. I got it. Yeah. So we are in the midst of uh, our measure D construction projects, of course, um, as the board well knows. and. Uh, we're down to a few projects, as I like to call it these days. I'm trying to land the plane, right? We're trying to, you know, kind of finish up all of our promises at both San Luis Obispo High School and Morro Bay High School. Um, at Morro Bay High, we have the the C building um, coming up, which is a classroom building, and then we're currently, um, you know, kind of midway through uh, the multi-purpose room cafeteria, the B, the you know, the A building there, um, the theater cafeteria. Uh, drama room, back, backstage, all those types of things, right? So, Is and then it's San Luis Obispo High School. We're basically doing the construction of the main 100 building, um, which is the main kind of classroom building, as well as the new, in this case, the center section is the, uh, the, 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 I should say the southern section was the science wing. The middle section is the uh, multi-purpose room, cafeteria, uh, the upstairs uh, at the 100 wing is kind of a digital media lab, a few classrooms, as well as the green room where they're going to do their, um, you know, Tiger News Network there. And then the front has a whole uh, set of classrooms that will be uh, used, you know, for a variety of purposes. Um, but this GMP today, and again, down to kind of really two projects left at San Luis Obispo High School, which is the quad kind of landscaping area, as well as finishing up that 100 building. So this is this GMP today, this um is coming to the board for approval, uh, which will basically redo the entire north section of that, that building. Um, that will um, incorporate about nine, 10 classrooms, a book room, um, the career center, as well as the library. As the board knows, we moved the library from the top of the 100 building down to uh, the northern section. Ryan, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is, is there some way to slide that over to the right a little bit so we can see the first column? Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I was oh, okay. I was I'm looking at this screen where you couldn't see it. So that's why I was keep moving oh, it over. So sorry. Good. So now you can. It's all good. Yeah. So um so Mr. Holcomb, of course, went to the actual bid opening in Modesto with Acme Construction. So this this goes out to bid, right? It's our design build um, project. Um, he was there for all the bid opening, so he can answer any questions the board might have um, in regards to that. Um, Chris Bonin is also tonight in Zoom. He's he's with us. So if we have any questions for Chris, but what happens is they open the bids, they go through everything. Um, there's multiple bids, each of the different um, kind of construction areas that you'll see. Uh, you know, and going through those bids, they they try to look at two things. One, of course, the low bid, right, for a particular project. They also look at the scope. Did they incorporate all the things that need to be done, um, need to be accomplished? So there's a variety of times of bids as you go through. Um, and then what happens after ACME is done and they bring this to us, they share all of those bids with us. Um, myself, uh, Chris Bonin, Mr. Um, Holcomb, um, as well as in this case, Steve Stewart, who's the, the construction manager um, at San Luis Obispo High School. We all sit down together. We go through every single light item and walk through and we look at all the different bids and why did you select that person? How did we go through? Um, and so what you'll see is that's the kind of the top part, right? Which is the um, kind of all the, the different bids that you'll go through. So painting, gypsum board, storefront, door hardware, sheet metal, you know, roof demo, finished carpentry. So a lot of those things at the top um, as you go through. And then there's this whole series of what's called allowances um, and so there's a couple that I'm going to point out, but these are the things that they have seen happen, um, you know, in terms of as they've gone through the southern part of the building, they've gone through the middle section of the building that they anticipate could happen, right? So there are allowances in that we're not, we're not spending those dollars yet. We're just making sure that there's enough money that, hey, when they go into put in the new utilities in the northern end and they dig into the floor and they cut it open, um, what they run into in the last two wings is rock underground. Really difficult rock, 
to, so then you have to, you know, break it up, dispose of it, go through. So all those costs are, there's, there's allowances in there. Should we need those um, types of services to happen? Now there are two in particular at the bottom, the acoustic ceiling and rough carpentry um, that we didn't want ACME to at this point, just go ahead and give grant that contract with, with the person yet, because we had some questions about it. So one was the acoustical, the acoustical ceiling in particular, the layout of the, the acoustical ceiling in the library area. So we wanted to vet that more with the architect. So instead of, um, you know, again, just giving that to the, to the ceiling person, we, we want to hold off, just make that allowance for now. And then once we have finished vetting the information um, with the architect, our hope is that that will come down in price and, and that it'll be less expensive than what we have. Um, and we'll be able to do that. So that's why you're seeing that as a, as an allowance versus at the top level, where we're just going to go ahead and issue the, the price at this time. Um, the second one was, was the rough carpentry bill. And so there was a really a huge range in that number um, in terms of rough carpentry. We're bringing the higher number to you tonight as an allowance, um, but, but they are deep dive into Mr. Holcomb helping with, with Mr. Bonin, um, looking at both those bids. Um, there's some potential scope issues that we want to iron out, make sure, um, you know, was the low bid really, did they leave a lot of things out or not, or are they just the low bid that we should be going with? So those are things that we, again, we will figure out. So before we issue the final, you know, kind of note to ACME to move forward on those, um, th there's, again, there's just some, those types of things that we want to make sure that we are on top of and, and, um, and, and vetting those bids as we move through. So the overall bid in this case, um, there was a little bit of work that's added to this northern part, and that is um, the sidewalk area around the 300 building and some asphalt work um, that's by in, in the 300 as well. We've, we have some ADA access issues. Um, so you'll see that's the third column over, uh, which refers, represents about $490,000 um, in sub bids, about $600,000 of this total package. Um, we were anticipating this entire bid to be more in the 9.1 million range in terms of our, our initial anticipate, anticipation. So after going through it, taking some things out, moving things through, um, the current GMP that I'm bringing, asking the board to approve tonight is for 8.9 million. Um, I'm hopeful that that number is going to be lower than that by the time we finish these projects, which um, again, we're finding uh, almost on every project that we've gone through that we haven't spent all of the allowances, we haven't spent all the contingencies. Um, and so these are the key things, right? So I, again, when I, earlier today, um, I was very pleasantly surprised um, that this came in kind of at least what we had expected, if not even a little lower. Um, and, and with what's happening in the world today with inflation and prices and um, you know raw materials, all those things, I was very happy uh, to see this. And I think Mr. Holcomb would probably share the same sentiment in talking with him, you know, just in terms of, you know, of where this bid came in. Okay. Questions from the board? Mr. Buckman. Yep, thanks for, thank you for all this hard work and, and keeping, keeping a lid on things. I have uh, two questions. So we have seen, I think there was a pipe through the center of San Luis High School that we didn't know about, mm -hmm. and now we're finding rock. It's my understanding that there's now technology where we could actually go over. I think it's rate of sonar or something. We could actually, so we we learn from this, right? So the next time we do construction, we'll probably include sonar or or something. Yeah, is that ground, is that ground possible? penetrating radar? Yep. Ground <laughs> I think we'll get yeah. Batman or something. Like I think one of the most powerful thing we're doing with with doing with Measure D at both you know high school campuses is we're getting rid of all of the old piping, the old utilities. We're not just burying things and building on top of it. Um, and we found a little bit of that. I mean, we just recently, you know, cut back in the asphalt and found a, a whole new, you know, like sewer line that had been abandoned, right? So those are things we are hitting with, with, main, um, with modernization. But I will say we are, again, getting rid of all the asbestos, getting rid of the old pipe in the ground, doing all of those things so that future, you know, construction at that site, you know, hopefully another 60, 70 years from now, right, when they need to modernize, you know, San Luis Obispo High School and Morro Bay High School again, um, you know, they're not going to run into those issues, right, that that 
you know, we're facing some of those things as we go through now. As far as sonar for ground, uh, I, don't, I, don't know. I, I don't know the technologies there yet, I you know, know. That, I, that tie in, but. Yeah. Superman's got x ray vision. So. Yes. Um, and then uh, just a second question. This has always been, a, I, and I'm, I don't think I asked this earlier on, but so there's the dollars in a bid, but then there's also the quality of the work that somebody performs. Is there is how do how do we how do we deal with that? Is we don't entertain bidders that produce poor quality. Okay, there, that's the answer to that. Marilyn, thanks. You have to live with it too long. And I just have. Thank you. I'm wondering, um, Mr. Pinkerton, Mr. Holcomb, I, Mr. Holcomb, you've been here the whole night, and so I I would love to <laughs> to ask you a question or two so that you can feel you know it was productive use of your time. <laughs> Um, these allowance figures, are they based on uh, on bids that were received or breakouts from yeah, yeah, portions of... Well, like in the case of framing, there was a huge difference. One was at 400000 the other was at 700000 the, the low bid had a, a lot of exclusions. Right. The might... high bid was the contractor who had... Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. The low bid was a, a contractor who had a lot of exclusions because he hadn't worked on the site before. So he excluded X, Y, Z. The high bidder had a lot of inclusions because he had worked on the building before. So our methodology is go to the low bid guy and tell him to put in the things that the high bid guy knew about that he didn't include. Go to the high bid guy and say, now take out the things that the other guy excluded. <laughs> And then we boil those two things down and that's the real difference. Yeah. But by the time the low bid guy figures all this out, sometimes they go, I'm gonna pass. So, I think, oh, Beryl, I'm sorry. Okay, so that's with the, the framing, but say for example, something that you know, uh, I don't know, existing floor prep. Let's so, take that one, $40,000. Is that based on a bid that you receive for that or on knowing that some of that will be required, but not the full extent of it? So you've just plugged in a number or ACME has plugged in a number. Well, the answer to those two things is yes. Okay. <laughs> Although they're entirely different. Uh, we got a lot of experience out of the south side. So a lot, of, a lot of that is interpolated over to the north side. But then we looked at, we had an area where we figured on grinding the concrete and we said, wait a minute, let's put carpet in because of sound transmission. Like so there's it. just a lot of lot of ads and deducts that go on. It's the nice part about our format is we put enough dollars in for it. And then even those those are allowances, we ask them to bid them. So there's like primary, secondary, and tertiary bidding going on. So but we ride herd on every bit of that meeting after meeting after meeting, you know. So but it's it's big dollars. It's not, you know, it's not a three hundred dollar deal. You know, there's significant money in the allowances. Yes, there is. So, and it may be that we won't need what you're saying is some of these things, or we won't need the the total financial commitment in, well, in the uh, allowance. Let's take the rock allowance. Now, we can't see the geology underneath that floor, and we've been surprised time after time. We, we think, boy, that's an easy deal. Let's put that sewer line in. And you go down two feet and you get it run into rock. So you bring out an excavator with a hammer on it. And it's just an arduous and expensive um, mm -hmm. procedure. Then when you get all of that done, you say, oh, well, we didn't figure the haul off. So we've got to figure out what, what it costs to haul it off. So anyway, it's, it's a lot of, you know, with a, with a, if you just go out and bid it, everybody has to put in a high number because they don't know. And so when you bid a modernization, it's, it's full of change orders. Well, we've found a way to avoid that. It's this design bill process, allowances, second, you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary bidding as we dial it right down to what we know to be the correct number. Oddly enough, it tends to be repetitive bidders getting it over and over again, because this process also takes a lot of the risk out of it for them. So that, it, I think it's a about the best delivery method we could have chosen for modernizations. Uh, I'm uh, really fascinated with the bidding process that you worked out down to a science or an art or something. And um, 
So can a, you say sometimes a loan bidder will drop off because of all the stuff he has to do. So then the higher bidder can become a loan bidder. He can, he, I know you have to take the loan bidder, yeah? Right, no, well, actually we don't. Oh, I actually we don't. Um, well, well, well it, it's kind of a yes and no questions. We categorize them, we take the low bidder, but the low bidder, by the time we tear the scope apart and say, Are, do you have this in your bid? And we can actually ask them, okay, we want to put your bid documents in escrow. And so if you got a guy who's prone to cheating or change order, Charlie, uh, they don't want to put those bid documents in escrow because then you go back and when you get a change order, say, okay, let's take those out now and see what you actually put in. So the, the process kind of pushes out the people who are who tend to be unfair. But it it's a lot of work, but the numbers are solid when we're done. That's great. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> it's got to be done. Yeah. So. Thanks. Okay. But Marilyn, a lot of a lot of the allowances that you'll see are things that they're from direct experience from doing the other side, doing the south. So like the sealant, I mean, they know joint sealants. That's what it costs to do it on this other side. They know the architects left it off. They know it's not in one of the bids. So they, hey, we, we need to have an allowance for this. We know it's going to come up. So those are the types of things that, again, we go through every single one. And we took off about five or six things, just so you know things that they brought up and we said, no, no, that should be in the architect bid because remember we learned it from the South. And so it's in the, it's in the documents now. So we're not gonna do that, right? So those are the, you know, again, each thing we go through and, and our people have learned a lot over this process and are very well educated about what, you know, what went wrong in one place and to make sure that it didn't happen, you know, again, in terms of sealing and, you know, what should be in the bid, what shouldn't be. So it's, it's definitely been a you know a good process as we were getting to the end um, of Measure D. So we should anticipate then that this contract, this section, will go more smoothly than the other side because of the yeah. lessons yeah. learned. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. Every yes. Wednesday we sat down with Acme Construction, all of our project managers, and go through everything, all of these allowances as we refine them, and. We will, I'm at what, 50% of the time we send the project managers back and say more data. You don't have enough numbers. You're coming to us with something you may not understand. So mm -hmm. go back and get the information. So it's, it's just over and over and over churning these numbers. And Acme is so. a good partner too, I will say. So like, yeah. and, you know, Mike brought it up, Mike Mustaghi, we're going through, he said, hey, you got concrete floors right now in the architect, you know, design for the library. You know, it's going to be really loud in there with the ceiling, those types of things. So that's why we said, okay, hold off. Let's pull out the concrete, you know, polishing. Let, let's revise that bid and let's go ahead and talk with the librarian. And yep, sure enough, let's put carpet in there. So that's why, you know, there's little adjustment things like that. So again, Acme has been a great partner to work with, to help us. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely a team effort. Okay. Thank you very much. So just real quickly, I'm going to just go slightly. Later on on the agenda, and it's not public, it's not part of the you know let's do it here mm -hmm. is thirteen point oh three, which is the Measure D Citizen Bond Oversight Committee's report, mm -hmm. and I just there's this whole piece where we have public, not even the school board, we have the public folks that are looking over our shoulder and your shoulder, and it's you know they just keep coming up with all this praise, and it's I, I just want. I guess I just want to share that because it's not going to become part of this public meeting. And um, every time they every time they look, everything's going really great. So I just want to congratulate you, yeah. maybe on behalf of the of that committee. Yeah, I think the whole team. It's been good, real positive. I think I think we better should, than I could have ever expected, honestly. I think we should rent you guys out. We'll we'll sell you to other school districts and <laughs> make make it make some money that way too. Um, is there anything else from the board? As Mandy, this is an action item. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address the board on this item? Okay, I'd bring it back. Would someone like to make a motion? Thanks. Mrs. Roger. I'll move approval. Let's see, where am I? Uh, item 10.03, Measure D, Design Build Modification Number 10, 
setting the guaranteed maximum price for the Slow High School Building 100 North modernization project. And I'll second that, please. Okay. We have a motion by Mrs. Roger, a second by Mr. Buckman. Is there any further um, discussion from the board? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back, Mrs. Roger. Thank you. Oh. I guess I'd take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Buckman, I'd take that as a yes. Um, Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Frame? Yes. Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. And I'm a yes. The motion carries 6 0 with one absent. Um, with that, we'll move to 10.04 proposed revisions to board policy 6142.7 physical education and activity. First reading. Uh, Mrs. Frost. Thank you very much. Yes, this is a mandatory update on a policy, PE and activity. A couple of changes to it, equal access and opportunities for all students. Um, talks about moderate to vigorous activity and age appropriate. Um, also talks about temporary exemptions, two years e exemptions and permanent exemptions to PE. My recommendation is that this comes back for a second reading. Okay. Is there any, any concern about bringing it back? Mrs. Dawson, is there any public comment? Seeing none, let's move to 10.05, proposed revisions to board policy 6149.1, high school graduation requirements, first reading. Thank you. Again, a mandatory update. So um, a couple of new things in this uh, amended graduation requirements for 1920 and 2021. We're looking at our juniors and seniors who were in school during the pandemic and really requiring our, our sites to look at whether or not they met graduation requirements and whether we can make changes to help them with that. And our people have already been working on that. Um, allows retroactive diplomas. Uh, think back to 2003, 2004, high school exit exam. So requires us to go back and look at those children who may not have passed and therefore did not get their diplomas. And then um, goes into detail about former students who could earn a diploma if they were interned during World War II, abruptly left the state, and it goes into some detail, veterans who enlisted during their senior year. So real detail there. And then also talks about honorary diplomas. My recommendation is that this comes back for a second reading. Okay. Is everybody good for bringing it back? Mrs. Dawson, does anybody from the public wish to address us on this? Okay, great. Let's move to the action consent agenda. Again, as always, please let me know if there's something you would like uh, pulled. And remember, we did make that slight change to 11.05. The language uh, will now read uh, district approved language, um, uh, dual immersion language um, support rather than the specific that we had in there. So let me know if you'd like something pulled. 11.01, .01, approval of certificated and classified personnel items. 11.02, approval of out of state field study trip, San Luis Obispo High School, robotics team to Dallas, Texas, congratulations. 11.03, approval of furniture and equipment requests. So 11.03, 11.04, approval of minutes, March 15th, 2022. 11.05, approval new certificated job description and additional position due language immersion support specialist. 11.06, approval of purchase orders and Cal card purchases. 11.07, disposal of surplus. 11.08, approval updated certificated job description. 11.09, approval of warrants and payroll. And 11.10, Authorization, continued use of remote teleconferencing provisions pursuant to AB 361 and government code section 54953. Okay. Um, Mr. Mr. Unger, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Um, if we could pull 11.05, um, please. 11.05? Yeah, certainly. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, would someone like to make a motion for 11.01 and 11.02? 11.04, 11.06 through 11.10. I'll do that. And okay. Just... And I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Mrs. Sheffer, second by Mrs. Roger. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Buckman. Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, hold on just a second. We're gonna we're gonna go through this first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Sheffer. It's yes. Mrs. Roger. Yes. Mrs. I'm sorry, Ms. Dobler Drew. Yes. Mrs. Frame. Yes. And I'm a yes. Uh, those carry. Mr. Buckman, eleven point zero three. Yes. Oh no! Wait a second. <laughs> sorry, it's a joke. Okay, so um, and when I looked at this, I saw a seesaw replacement, and I don't know if this is a mm -hmm. physical saw to cut wood, or whether this is a seesaw, which I haven't seen on campuses no. anymore. I, in fact, I think they may be highly recommended not to be on campuses. So I, I don't need an answer right now, and I'll but but as long as I'm pretty sure it's not a a kid going six feet up in the air and then falling off. I will find out and let you Thank know. Thank you very much. I'm not positive. I'm going to say the wrong thing. Well, so I'm going to move. Well, I will find out and let you know. Okay. Um, I'm going to move approval 11.03. There's no contingency, but I'm pretty sure that staff will be careful about this. Can someone like to second I'll that? second. Second by Mrs. Rogers. It actually is a seesaw playground equipment, and I think it's Baywood. It's, it is. It is. He says, yeah, Chris Bonner just told me it is. Okay. So wait a second. So. So do we have seesaws at any other of the school sites? He's putting it, he's pulling it up right now. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting for him to yes. reply. Oh, we do. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, yes. We do. Okay, so I'm- I, I want to say it's in the, like the TK. Oh, like a little like tiny TK plastic kindergarten type thing? area, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I just, you know, I, I, I would just question this. Um, and I, I thought that it was covered in code, but maybe not. But this just scares the heck out of me having Falling off one personally, but yeah, I don't think these are the six down. foot version, but I'll okay. find out. All right, all right. I will ensure that it I will ensure that it is a safe seesaw, seesaw if we're going to I think it's great yes. with a maybe helmet and you. harness yes. and yeah, I got it. Right. Thank you very much, staff. I'll move approval yes. of 11.03. Okay. So we have a motion by Mr. Buckman and a second by Mrs. Roger. We do need to go to the public since we did pull that. Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone who wants to address yeah, us on this? Seeing no one, Mr. Buckman. Yes. Mrs. Roger. Sure. Uh, Mrs. Sheffer. Yes. Mrs. Frame. Yes. Uh, Ms. Dobler Drew. Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries six zero six uh, four no against with one absence. Um, Mrs. Frame, you pulled eleven point zero five. Thank you. Um, I just um, a little more um, information about um, this. I mean, it looks like it's for um, 2223, but um, tell me a little bit about that because that's a lot going on for you know that site and um, just a little bit more you know, yeah, information. Sure. About that. Uh, what we've seen this year is the need for additional expertise in dual language immersion implementation. Uh, on-site PD for teachers, um, laying out of uh, plans for the school year scope and sequence, developing of instructional materials uh, for use by teachers and that kind of thing. So this would be in addition to the MTSS positions that currently exist on that site. So it'd be in, in conjunction with the principal supporting, it's kind of a Correct. whole, just adding uh, a person with expertise to that team. Exactly, with a with a focus on implementation of the dual language program. So it'd be short term. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to make a well? Actually, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Would then would if it's a short term position, would it be funded with COVID funds? Well, we've applied for a grant from the uh, CDE for four hundred thousand dollars over three years specifically for implementa uh, implementing new dual immersion programs. And we haven't heard back from the CDE yet, but we'll we would figure out the funding if that, uh, you know, we weren't able to get the grant. Yeah, so grant funding, Title Title III, there's other things we could look at, potentially mm -hmm. Title I, um, you know, long-term. Remember the board has already voted and set up a plan for how we're spending our COVID funds. Right. So I'm just letting, so oh. that is the plan. We, we, those are the things we're spending those dollars on. So we don't just add new things to it, I guess is my point, right? So, but definitely through LCAP, things like that, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of the budget mm -hmm. that will come forward for approval into the future. So it wouldn't really be a COVID one time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so cost. this, but this is a full-time certificated position. We're flying and it as 0. 0.752 
full-time to 1.0. So a little bit of flexibility. Okay, there. and this person will work with Pacheco and Baywood. Primar teachers. Primarily Baywood. Primarily Baywood, mm -hmm. okay. And, and we don't have, it's the bird in the hand. We don't have the grant in the hand, but we're gonna, Mr. Pinkerton tells us we will find the funding source for it. And, and we've actually had somebody in this position. I think part of this, something like it, right? In terms of helping yeah. assistance there. Right. But, but this was one where, again, I think from a personnel HR standpoint, Dan Block, you know, we, we need to have, if we're gonna have this position, we need to have an actual, um, <coughs> you know, job description for the position, right? So it's not just, hey, it's a DLI teacher that's gonna go over and help at school. No, no, this is, these are the duties they're gonna do. So that's why this is coming forward to you today right. is that we're gonna have a specific job description of what this person is going to do, which will be very critical if we're going to receive federal or state funds, that exactly. they're gonna ask for that, right? They're gonna need that type of documentation, that background. So that's why this is coming to the board, you know, in terms of more formalizing the position itself. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Dawson, we do need to go to the public. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address us? Okay. I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Mrs. Frame, would you like to make this motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, certificated um, position, um, the du dual immersion um, immersion support specialist. Someone like to second that? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Buckman. So we have a motion by Mrs. Frame, a second by Mr. Buckman. Mrs. Frame? Yes. Mr. Buckman? Yes. Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Ms. Roger. Just say yes. Yeah, I'm going to support it, but um, I, I would like it noted that I have concerns about the funding mechanism for it because um, of all of the LCAP feedback that we got um, indicating a, a need for counselors and other support personnel. I, I don't doubt that this is a very important position. I, I would like to see a, someone doing this work, um, but I do have some concerns about the funding mechanism, but I will support it. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. And I'm a yes, motion carries 6-0 with one absence. Thank you. Um, 13, I'm sorry, 12.01 advanced agenda. Okay. Uh, 13.01 reports by board members. Ms. Dobler, do. I want to thank Mrs. Miller at Sinsheimer for giving me a tour. And I saw some really good teaching and I saw lots of children faces. Very different. It's good right. to see. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Mr. Buckman. Yeah. So um, I was up here talking, I think, to Ryan, um, which was fortuitous. Um, having a short meeting and um, I got to the district office and here was this lawnmower cool. that was making no noise. And it was just, it was great. And it was also not polluting. Um, and so I, I, I went up to the driver who could hear me when I asked, said hello. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get his last name. So I talked with Bobby for a little bit um, and he, he, had, he said he loved it. Um, but he also said that it, it allowed, um, I'm going to say M&O, but to, to sort of work with their, with their scheduling because they could actually put this on a campus and not drown out teachers. And so I thought that was an, another really a benefit that I hadn't thought of from this, uh, from this electric, you know, having this electric vehicle. And I just, I feel that it's so important that the district become... I don't know. We educate the K-12 students. We have adult school. Um, we, we work with special ed kids. And, and we also are a model for some things in the community. Civility, um, getting along. Um, I don't know. I made a short list. Fiscal responsibility, social interactions. And, and here we are also being a leader in, and an educator in terms of climate, the climate crisis that we're facing. So. I was very happy to meet Bobby and meet the lawnmower. <laughs> Mrs. Sheffer. Uh, Wizard of Oz was wonderful. I, my son accompanied me who spent 
hours and hours of his life in that former um, theater dark room. And he was very impressed. And um, so that was fun. I also, I uh, Rick's not here right now, but I would thought of him when he was talking about the comment on the LCAP about responding to something because they just had seen so many surveys. And I attended Student Senate last week, which as always was just a, an amazingly wonderful experience. But when I was look, listening to one of the groups talking about how to get more information from their students, the student, one, the student taking the note, one of the students suggested surveying and everyone said, no, no more <laughs> surveys. We're being surveyed all the time. We don't want any more surveys. So um, I thought that was a really interesting <coughs> response that, you know, just let us come up with some ideas. That's why we're here and we can, we can do the best we can based on the information from Youth Truth, which they all took so seriously and is of course, again, a great tool that we're using to empower our students and help them do the hard work of being leaders on their campuses. And I very much appreciate that. Anyone else? Yes, Frame, and then Mrs. Rodney. Yeah, I just wanted to um, piggyback on what um, Ms. Sheffer said, because what I appreciate um, about that student senate is really the authentic voices that we're hearing directly from the students. And they kind of tell it how it is. And um, it's, it's uh, refreshing, it's eye-opening, and it's kind of important opportunity for us to hear. And then um, along with Mrs. Sheffer, um, enjoying that marvelous production of Wizard of Oz, and I too enjoyed Toto. <laughs> This is Roger. Thank you, for real this time. Um, I attended uh, together with, I believe Mrs. Sheffer was there and Mr. Buckman, uh, a Zoom seminar uh, put on by the County Office of Education for superintendents and board members having to do with equity and focusing on the FAIR Act. And it was very well done. And um, it was nice to have the opportunity to converse with other people from around the county, other board members and, um, and other administrators. And then I also last night went to Morro Bay High School um, open house where I saw Mr. Unger. And uh, it was really different from open houses, previous open houses because of the construction. It was done in the beautiful new quad and the various disciplines set up tables and um, the Spanish students, the students in the Spanish classes um, brought food for which I think they got extra credit. And so we all ate and the band played and they did a, a number from, is it called the, it was, what was it, Chris? Oh, it, oh no, it's Seussical the Musical? The Seussical the Musical, there you go. Um, and also they had terrific things, you know, to look at in the ceramics lab, ceramics for sale, and I went in the engineering. And it's just, it's just so wonderful. It's, it's really wonderful, the, uh, the spaces that, that have been created for kids. I mean, and that they're really well utilized mm -hmm. and they like yeah. them very much. Yeah. So that's, that was my evening last night. Thank you. And, and as with several of the other board members, of course, I went to the Wizard of Oz and it was, it was, it was impressive. And the new theater is, is quite impressive. And I think, you know, when I was in stage crew back in junior high school, we, you know, we made sets and things. The, the technology that the students are using is pretty tremendous. And then you know, again, Morrill Bay High School's open house, um, just some of the cool stuff that they're going on and the excitement that I saw there, especially um, in some of the CTE classes. Um, uh, the new, you know, J, the J-Wing, it's been there for a while, but it's still exciting to walk into the ceramics lab. It's exciting to walk into the green room and see the pirate, you know, see Mrs. Hainer and, and the, the pirate press online um, to walk into the CTE labs and see the the, the computer operated um, lathes and all that kind of stuff. It's really great. It's just great stuff. And then 
uh, props to Ms. to Tirza Aban who who took calculus and 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 made it real for the students. They had to design things and show their designs. It was very exciting. So. Um, yeah, it, it was really, and, and it was a beautiful day at Morro Bay High School. Yeah. It's just a beautiful night. So on that note, um, oh, Mark, you have more. Yeah, I just, you know, there, I just, I just sort of want to thank my fellow board members because the intensity and the great questions that they bring and the full-time attention and not doing, you know, not texting, you just, it's just, it's really wonderful that we um, that we can accomplish this stuff. And I just wanted to thank everybody. Thank you. So our next, we will have no more meetings in April. Spring break is coming up, it's next week. The board will next meet, I believe May 3rd, and we will have three board regular board meetings in May plus a study session. So it's gonna be a busy month. We have a lot of work to do. We will be, we will hopefully be approving the LCAP on May 31st, I believe. Um, so we have a lot going on and um, it's a it's a busy time of year. But thank you, everybody. Thanks for your attention and thanks for the great in-depth reporting we had tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.